Welcome to Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. This is episode 132, and I am your host, Pervez Ahmed, and I'm joined by my co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, it's not like I'm Pervez. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. You know, I just realized I always say my co-host. You're actually not my co-host. You're you're the show's co-host. Oh, thank you. Thank Sorry you. I appreciate that. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought uh, you were going to say my cousin. That's why I was <laughs> well, like... Well, you're definitely that, yeah. too. I, I'm doing really well, alhamdulillah. I know we're really excited about today's show and what we're going to be discussing. Yeah, actually, we're kind of bringing it full circle. The stuff we talk about in our personal lives is actually coming to the show. So today's topic is, is something that's close to home. Pervez and I are... are both the daughters of two girls ranging from age 10 to 20. I have a 15 year old, 10 year old. Yours are like, what, 13 and 20. And so whenever we hang out, we go on hikes, we go get dinner or whatever it is. We're always talking about the joys, but also the challenges of parenting. And we're sharing ideas about how to be the best dads possible and what it takes to raise practicing Muslim children in today's day and age. And to me anyway, it feels like that just as we start figuring it out, they're onto the next phase of their youth and there's like a new challenge to think about. Time certainly isn't waiting on us to get it all figured out out perfectly and you really don't get do-overs. So this is like super top of mind for both of us. Yeah. This is a hot topic on our minds. 100% agree. But I also imagine that for many of our listeners who have children, they too struggle with this feeling of at times feeling ill-equipped to grapple with the growing challenges of raising healthy, acclimated, and well-rounded and adjusted children who are rooted and committed to their faith and at the same time who are culturally competent in today's American society. Today's young people face challenges in the classroom, in their social spaces, in their peer groups, and the challenge of living an authentic identity that is both Muslim and American, and at the same time, struggling to feel a sense of belonging within their Muslim communities and within their Muslim spaces. Meanwhile, as parents, we find ourselves trying to connect with our children in a world that is very different than the one we grew up in. And while there are certainly overlaps to the challenges that our parents faced raising us, such as elements of a culture that is oftentimes alien to our own, the culture that we seek to foster in our homes, and a culture that is oftentimes at odds with an Islamic ethos. I think the challenges that our young people face are far more existential and dire than the ones that we faced when we were growing up. The rising tide of moral relativism, nihilism, an extreme sense of individual autonomy with mantras like YOLO, you only live once, my body, my choice, which may as well be my life, my choice. I want to do as I please, do as I want to do. In addition to an educational system and academia that challenges the very foundations of a theocentric, of a God-centric worldview, replacing it with the orthodoxy and the new dogma of absolute empiricism and scientism. And so as we kick off today's discussion, and what I hope is a series of conversations that we have addressing parenting in these difficult and challenging times, I wanted to frame what proceeds, whether it's this particular discussion or the one that we hope to have in the future, is to proceed with framing the conversation within two verses of scripture. The Quran in Surah 66, Surah Tahrim, in verse 6, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, He says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu qu anfusikum wa ahlikum nara Oh, you who believe, save yourselves and save your families from the fire whose fuel is men and stone. In the hadith recorded in both Bukhari and Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ says, كُلُّكُمْ رَأٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُلٌ عَنْ رَأِيَتِهِ فَالْأَمِيرُ رَأٍ وَهُوَ مَسْؤُلٌ والرجل راء على أهله وهو مسؤول والمرأة رائية على بيت زوجها وهي مسؤولة ألا وكلكم راء وكلكم مسؤول عن رأيته. The Prophet peace be upon him says, all of you are shepherds and each of you is responsible for his flock. A leader is the shepherd over his flock. A man is the shepherd of the people of his house and he is responsible for them. A woman is the shepherd of the house of her husband and she is responsible for those in her household. Each of you is a shepherd 
and each of you is responsible for his or her flock. So Omar, please introduce our guest for today. Absolutely. So super excited about today's guest who we've been wanting on the show for quite some time. So I'm really excited it's actually happening. She's also a personal friend. So it's, it's nice to be able to catch up with her. She's somebody who has dedicated many years towards gaining a better understanding of and developing expertise on exactly this subject of raising Muslim youth in America. And our guest, who I'll, I'll introduce officially here in a sec, is a spiritual teacher covering many topics. And parenting isn't the only topic that she speaks about. She also speaks about mental health. And we could probably do a show just on that as well. But we wanted to focus on parenting today and parenting uh, and navigating the challenges of raising Muslim children in America. So, of course, our guest is Ustada Husay Mujaddidi. Uh, Ustada Husay Mujaddidi has been serving the Muslim community for over 25 years as a teacher, public speaker, author and writer, spiritual counselor, and mental health advocate. She began her Islamic studies over 20 years ago at Zaytuna Institute in the Bay Area, California, where she, for several years she served as the lead female organizer and studied Aqidah, Sira, Hanafi Fiqh, Tazkiyah and Nafs, Tajweed, Hadith, Arabic, and other sacred subjects with several resident visiting scholars. She offers talks throughout the year locally and internationally on a range of topics including spirituality, self-development, Sira, women's issues, family, marriage, youth issues, social media literacy and safety, and mental health advocacy. Uh, Usada Husay teaches weekly and monthly spiritual development classes for adults and youth for multiple local and international organizations and via social media. She also teaches Sira, Quran, logical and critical thinking, as well as Islamic studies in her local area. And Ustad Osai is a mental health advocate and she uses both her social media platforms to promote emotional and spiritual well-being and offers workshops on social emotional learning for students and educators throughout the year. She's a wife and mother of two and resides in California with her family. If you've heard of Mental Health for Muslims, she was a founder of that website uh, along with her cousin, Dr. Nafisa Sikandari, who's a fellow barrier native and clinical psychologist. This website, mentalhealthformuslims.com, provides information about mental health issues it's clinically supported and Islamically sound at the same time. With that introduction, <laughs> welcome Ustad Husay. Good to see you again. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to both of you percent. and to your wonderful listeners, um, mashallah. And I need to make a note to send you a much <laughs> shorter bio <laughs> next time. But thank That's you uh, for, for making it through that. Um, alhamdulillah. It's an honor to be with uh, both of you. I've heard uh, wonderful things about your uh, podcast actually over the years. But today I learned that mashallah, you've been around for 10 years. That's incredible. That is incredible. We've been blessed. Yeah. Mashallah. Thank you. Thank Mashallah. you for saying that. Thank you. I mean, we've been blessed with some luminaries over the years, and I think that tradition continues tonight. Oh, I'm not just saying that because you're day. sitting in front of me. Um, someone I've admired through both your online Likewise. contributions to the discourse, but also in person and in our community here in the Bay Area. So deeply honored. So I guess I'll just go start because we often like to start off with origin story. But I have to ask because mm -hmm. I know the Mujaddidi clan is uh, is <laughs> widespread. Um, of course, some of our listeners may be also familiar with your cousin, mm -hmm. Sidi Feridun uh, Mujaddidi mm -hmm. of Rumi Bookstore, among obviously being a scholar in his own right and a poet in his own right. <laughs> Mashallah. But so tell us a little bit about your family background. and uh, Sure, Alhamdulillah. Your... Um, so as you mentioned, it is, Mashallah, very large family, so large that I don't even uh, know many of them, unfortunately. We're very spread out. Um, uh, but alhamdulillah, you know, when we first uh, immigrated here to the U.S., um, we initially lived in the Washington, D.C. area, my family, you know, as mm -hmm. refugees. And then there was kind of like this uh, exodus, I guess, or, or move toward California. So a lot of our family came uh, to the Bay Area, to specifically to Fremont. So there was at a point where I'm sure you guys are, are familiar being you know, residents nearby, that Fremont was once called Little Kabul. And I really do think a lot of that had to do with my family because we were pretty much everywhere, like everywhere yeah. you went. And our weddings, mashallah, would be in uh, near the thousands sometimes. But now we're much more I've heard, spread out. I, I've heard the moniker a Little Kabul, but also uh, Fremontistan. So I don't know which one is preferred <laughs> among the you know, it's changed Afghani on... diaspora. Was there one person yeah. who was like the spark? <laughs> Of, of that movie? Yeah. You know, it's a good question. I mean, I think every uh, child would, would say, my dad, you know, and, but to be honest, alhamdulillah, my, my father who passed away, Allah alhamdulillah, in 2015, did have a legacy of bringing a lot of the family over mm. because he was actually one of the few English speaking, he had been educated in England and he had traveled prior to uh, 
you know, immigrating. So he actually was able to really facilitate a lot of people's like just, you know, immigration uh, paperwork and bring. So a lot of my uh, uncles and aunts, all of them came through my dad and then other extended family members as well. And he actually, even up until his passing was, that was like a service, a side service he was offering for people mm. because he was so good at it. But Michelle, so I do believe that he was very integral in bringing a lot of my family over. And many of the people who um, spoke at his, you know, funeral mm. shared that it he was instrumental in in that process. So, alhamdulillah. But yeah. Um, and uh, his name? His name for the record? Muhammad. Hazrat Muhammad Majaddidi. Yeah, Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Mashallah. But mashallah. yeah, there's a lot. I mean, the historically, yeah. mashallah, the family is uh, well known as we are descendants of... Um, of Mujaddid al Fathani, who was a res uh, who was a descendant of Sayyidina Umar, uh, radiallahu an. So that's that's the historical, mm. uh, yeah, religious significance of the family. And then, of course, there's political relevance to um, one of the, uh, I think, interim or presidents. I don't actually know, unfortunately, the the, the duration. But uh, Sabrullah Mujaddi was the president of Afghanistan for a period. That's right. And so there are a lot of political. There's, there's a political significance to the family. I too. have to just go take a side note. <laughs> uh, just this, because as a friend, I'm going to share sure. the story. So, um, the, the punchline is I may, maybe we're distant cousins, because my mom had a dream mm -hmm. uh, where she hugged Hazrat Omar. So, she went to a scholar and said, What's the dream about? He said, you had this dream because because you're a descendant. Because he hugged you means you're his mehram. So anyway, I just wanted to share that real quick. So we're, we're, we're long lost cousins. Well, I'm sorry. Heard. Now you're making you know. Right. Like, yeah. I've never heard the story. Amazing. It's yeah. beautiful. Is that why you were named Omar? No, this, oh. okay, this was, I don't know the timing okay. of yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah. I, but I just thought I, it's like one of those stories that's in the back of your head, but since yeah. I had to share right. now where she's cousin hey, herself. Hey, you know what? <laughs> there, that seems to be a theme here. I started MHRM with my cousin. You guys started this. I think, mashallah, there's something there. <laughs> nice. no, it's, it would be an honor uh, either way, mashallah. You're a yeah. dear brother, and I'm really honored to, to know you for, you, you aged us, but I guess we now have to reveal it to everyone over... Over 20 years, we've known each other, mashallah. Yeah, since around 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, when we were just five. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, but so how, were, you, were you born in the Bay Area or in Actually, AC? no. So I am um, one of five, mm -hmm. uh, my siblings and I. We all came. Uh, we were five. What is the line? We have a line that we say five under a certain age. Not five under five. Five under eight, I think, is what was when we all came. So I was really young. I was born in Afghanistan, in Kandahar. But I was barely two, I think, when we came here. Hmm. So you're in the Bay Area, I presume, this mid '80s. Um, what was it like growing up in the Bay Area mm -hmm. as a um, somebody who came from Afghanistan? Great question. Um, my memory is actually really fond, and it's because, Alhamdulillah, uh, you know, a lot of us came at the same time. So I remember being in school and never really feeling out of place because I had, uh, in some cases, cousins, in some cases, you know, neighbors that were also Afghani um, going to the same school that I went to. And actually, I met some really close friends in middle school, which when we came from Washington, D.C. area, um, initially, that I was in middle school. So I met many Afghans, and those were my core group. And then we kind of transitioned on to high school. So I was always surrounded by my own people. And then, of course, other extended uh, groups as well, Muslims. So, mm. alhamdulillah, I, I really felt feel very blessed that I had uh, that I was surrounded by such uh, wonderful people. To this day, many of them I'm still in connection with via Facebook. So, yeah. Okay. And your family was pretty much were they in tune with their the Avani culture? And and I'm also curious, growing up as a Muslim. Sure. Uh, so, Alhamdulillah, because our family has a religious significance, we we definitely uh, were. Um, raised with very conservative religious values. For example, um, from a very early age, I remember we fasted, no matter, like it was just kind of understood that you reach, even sometimes before puberty, you were fasting. And prayer, we went to Sunday school. My father actually taught me uh, in Sunday school. Uh, my grandfather, Allah, he actually taught all of us, you know, the basic, you know, fardain, just wudu, you know, in terms of tahara and prayer. So we had a lot of that influence growing up, but religion was not ever, you know, forced upon us. So my father was very um, just fair and, and taught us but expected us to be responsible for ourselves. So my journey officially in Islam didn't really begin until later, but I was a very 
proud uh, Muslim because of the influence of my my upbringing and my family. And in fact, I remember, I, I've shared this before, but my father, when Salman Rushdie's book came out, he took my me and my brother to a protest in San Francisco. And that actually shaped, it was a really powerful memory for me because I was too young to really understand what was happening, but I saw my father and all these other men, mostly men who were really angry for the sake of their love for the Prophet Sallallahu and I understood things, you know, watching them that maybe, you know, in my uh, young age, I wouldn't have otherwise understood. But those are really core memories for me. And then later in life, of course, it all came. Right. To, I, I came to understand the significance of that event, you know, globally. For sure. Right? How important that was. So he he would take us to things like that. And, of course, you know, Eid and, and being in the masjid. Um, my grandfather was also one of the founders of like a, an Afghan refugee mosque that was in Concord at the time. So we were pretty involved in that in that life. But it wasn't... We weren't forced, and mm. you know, it wasn't something that we were pushed to do. Like I hijab, all of these things came later for me. Even mm. praying regularly, it didn't come until I, I embraced the faith fully. We got to pencil that, <laughs> or put a pin in that one, because I'm really curious what that right balance is. But we'll come back to that well, when we right talk about the topic of parenting. Specific to your, um, you know, you coming of age, as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned it twice now, this idea of y your own conversion, yeah, right? But, right, uh, Like, it, you know, it willfully and with volition accepting the faith and, mm -hmm. and really submitting to the faith. When does that happen? No, the I appreciate the there? question because I, you know, in, in speaking on these topics, I've kind of unearthed a lot of memories that, you know, were buried in a way. Mm -hmm. So I actually have this phrase that I use where it's the, you know, it was my first, like the seeds were planted. So that one of those seeds that were planted was definitely attending that protest because I just saw yeah. things I never saw before. The next seed that was planted was actually the, again, I'm going to age all of us because I, I know you guys remember this, but when the movie Malcolm X was mm -hmm. released, right? Of course. Um, right before that movie was released, we had Amir Abdul Malik, which you all know, right. come to our high school and we had an MSA. So that there were, you know, Muslim students there. But again, as an, a culturally, uh, you know, I was Muslim, but when he came to speak that day, it literally transformed me. So I actually feel I did have a conversion in a way because, you know, I never even knew who Malcolm X was. Here I hear this dynamic speaker who's an American like me. He doesn't have an accent. Most of the people I knew up until that point were, you know, immigrant uncles or that I was exposed to. But here's an American who's speaking in a, you know, in a way that really resonates with me about someone that I am fascinated by. So I remember literally going to the library that day, picking up the book, reading it cover to cover, and I felt like I had um, just this, you know, total new identity. And I was so ardently proud of my faith. And then the movie obviously helped yeah, that because right. you're represented now, right? For you sure. feel representation. Seeing the Hajj on the big screen. Oh my gosh. Right? It was Pivotal. so, so Such moving. A transformative so, experience. Yeah. Um, I can, I hearing can, an actor recite Fatima. Yes. Yeah, I sure. definitely, that was a pivotal yeah, for uh, sure. book and, and movie for me as well. I remember so just a funny little story. Again, being a Bay Area um, resident, you might get a kick out of it. I, I came here, I was growing up in Spokane and mm -hmm. I came here to visit my sister and I went to the flea market and I picked up a, this Malcolm X shirt that had like this big Malcolm face on it. And, and, I, and I took it back to Spokane where I'm like the only non-white kid. Wow. And I was wearing it proudly. So, so. Marshall, that's is, amazing. Is this, is this the, uh, the yeah. flea market in Oakland? No, the San Jose. San Jose. Oh, San Jose. Yeah, that's okay, the okay. bigger one. Yeah. Okay, okay. No, because it's funny because we, we haven't talked about it. But I mean, Afghanistan certainly has been something we, we have touched on. The kite runner begins exactly. at a flea market Got in it. the Bay Area. About that. Yep. Yeah, I don't right. know if that's the San Jose one or the Oakland one, but it, you know. I'm not sure either. But I know, like my a lot of my uh -huh. even my father, he he did the Concord one. So there's oh. there's a few. Mm. They're spread out. Right. But we we were also a flea market family. Like yeah. a lot of we were big time. Yeah. So and maybe so, that's a shared I think immigrant experience. <laughs> but speaking of shared immigrant experiences, I think what you what you highlighted in kind of your own journey, what you called seeds, mm -hmm. um, I think is really interesting because even when we have spoken to and, and listeners of the show know this like people who are quote unquote converts to the faith right mm -hmm. people who came from another faith tradition and accepted islam conversion is not an event it's a process totally. so it's much like what you're describing in terms of they had seeds that were planted along the way and interestingly enough since we are talking about malcolm x mm -hmm. like, like oh, he he played a pivotal role his bio his autobiography for a lot of people that Absolutely. we've had on the show and i think that continued the fact that 
people who read that autobiography, like Dr. Omar comes to mind. Mm-hmm. In, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Right. But I'm saying someone, yeah. people we've had on the show, yeah, and yeah. I can sp- I can speak to that story. Dr. Omar talks about reading it in like the 1960s, right? Wow. Meanwhile, that continued, that book continues to inspire people, and you're reading it, what, in the 1990s? Right. I'm reading it in the, 90, in the 1990s, same right. thing. Yeah. So, yeah, Kareem, it's like decades and yeah. decades. That's why I was it, thinking, mentioning Kareem, because yeah. back in this late 60s. There right? you go. Right. So, and, and we've talked about Kareem and the yeah. Hanafi Muslims, but yeah, that was exactly. a couple of episodes ago. <laughs> That's a really, I think, a fascinating point. Were there other seeds? Sorry, because we, we stopped at the Malcolm X Yeah, so these were kind of like awakenings. You know, you have this awakening about who you are. And, you know, I I was going to mention this later, but I guess it's kind of relevant now. You know, when you're going through it, you're not aware of the process of adolescence as, um, you know, Eric Erickson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He's a well-known psychologist. But he has the eight stages of development that you go through in your life. And adolescence is actually the time where youth are are conflicted with the dilemma of role confusion and identity. And so that that's just a natural part of adolescence, which is why, you know, parents are always like, what happened to my child? They, they're completely, you know, different than I remember them because they themselves are struggling to understand a lot of things that are happening to them. So we have that layer. And then for obviously the immigrant experience, you know, and the Muslim experience of the 90s and even the early 2000s, you get into 9-11, this is going to be a, a much... A really uh, compounded issue in terms of identity. So for me, there was a lot of surfacing of like, I'm very proud as as a Muslim, but then in terms of what that means in in personal practice, that didn't come until college, and I had another really powerful experience. So I was proud as a Muslim, but I wasn't practicing. So that's it's right. interesting, right? Yeah, so I, I felt sure. the identity, but I wasn't acting upon it. And then in college, what happened was. I, because of my personality type, you know, I'm sanguine temperament, so I'm generally outgoing and, and pretty social. I had some of the sisters at the local, I went to a junior college here at, in the Bay, and one of the sisters who, um, you know, was fully practicing hijabi and everything, she came up to me, she said, you know, you should, you should, you know, be the president of the MSA because you have like that leadership quality. And, and you know, I accepted it because nobody else was doing it. So she wanted, you know, I said, okay, I guess I can do it. And then we had discussions during the course of that period where she also encouraged me to wear hijab, but I I wasn't there yet. So I, I remember just looking at her like, <laughs> okay, but not really, you know, in my mind. And so um, I, I took on the role of, of being the president. And then we got to this point where the um, advisor to the club asked me if I could rally the troops, as they say, um, and bring the MSA uh, club members to an event that she was hosting with an international speaker her name was Soraya Mire. I'll never forget her name, but she was going to come and speak about FGM. Mm. And she wanted the Muslim community because she said she's Muslim and she's really, she wants the support of the Muslims to be there. So I, you know, did what I was, you know, I, I mean, I responded. I said, sure, we'll come and support. And I got a lot of my fellow MSA members to join. So we sat in that hall and there was a full, I mean, fully packed room. I mean, there, we're talking, you know, women's studies groups. A lot of the clubs on campus joined this event because it was such a pretty shocking uh, topic. And so people wanted to come out and show her support. So she gets up on stage and I find, I mean, immediately she she starts speaking negatively about Islam. Mm-hmm. And I, we're all just kind of shocked. And I'm like, am I mishearing her? But she's, she doesn't sound like she's Muslim. She sounds like she's, you know, yeah. hating on Islam. And she started to really come after al the Prophet said him. And at that point, all that built up of, I guess, you know, what was those seeds that were planted started to, in a way, come mm. to the surface because I couldn't, my ghira, I couldn't handle hearing her say all these things about the Prophet ﷺ, and I felt very responsible. So they were passing out the mics to get people to ask questions. And I immediately raised my hand, and they gave me the mic. And this is a pretty big auditorium, alhamdulillah, but I got, I was one of the few questioners, first few questioners. So I, I just stood up and I said, you know, I'm Muslim, and w- there are a lot of Muslims in this audience, and you've done nothing but offend us. You're, you're using your s- platform, and you're lying about Islam and our prophet. And I just started saying all this stuff. And they cut my mic, and there was a big uproar because wow. everybody was like, oh, my, it's turning around. And I just remember it was like this, you know, mob scene kind of because they were thinking, you know, I, I'm offending the guest speaker. So they cut my mic, and then she made some snarky remark, and she moved on. And so 
I wasn't done though because I felt like she just, you know, she was she didn't receive any of the feedback. Well, she just took a shot at me. So then I, I, um, I one of my friends, Allah Rahma, she's passed away. Her name was Hiba. She's Egyptian. Um, and by the way, none of us are wearing hijab or anything, so we kind of blend in. But Hiba had these really nice big blonde kind of curls and she did not look brown okay right. so i just was like how about she'll call on you because the rest of us kind of looked now a little you know suspicious maybe but she didn't so i said you get the mic mm -hmm. and then give it to me <laughs> so that's what she did <laughs> so she raised her hand i gave her the mic she tossed it back to me and now i went for for round two and at that point because I was so upset, I felt so offended and mad that, you know, things really escalated and people were getting up out of their chairs. It was just like kind of mayhem. Right. They had to shut down the event, which I saw as a success because yeah. she was such, I mean, she was terrible. She said really offensive things. So Alhamdulillah, after that night, when I saw the reaction of everybody and I just kind of, you know, started processing everything, I just had this existential kind of crisis. Like, who am I? You know, here I am, president of the MSA. I'm, I have obviously love for my faith, but I don't act on my faith. I'm not wearing hijab. I don't pray consistently. I, I fast because we always fasted. But other than that, you know, I'm not really, where's my Islam? So that started me on a journey of really questioning the sincerity of my faith because I felt it, but I wasn't acting upon it. And so that led to two weeks later, I, I saw dreams. I saw a lot of martial powerful things where I feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was guiding me through that event. And two weeks later, I wore hijab. <laughs> and it ties back to your ties back to the event your dad took you to because yes. both had the same spirit of protecting the, the Prophet. There you Hassan, go. Right? Yeah. There you go. I, I didn't make that connection, but you're right. And I, maybe that was why I needed to see that because I saw the the love, um, even though they were upset protesting yeah. my father explained in the car on our way there and on our way back it's from love exactly. so i think that seed was you're right mashallah i mean it felt like those passions come from like yeah. you said a place of love you saw some you said powerful visions and it really you know it starts you on this journey or expedites mm -hmm. you on this journey i'm curious what the next sort of seed if you will is sure so i mean i've went through so many different right. <laughs> kind of detours and along the way <laughs> along yeah, the way right but alhamdulillah, when I, you know, wore um, hijab, that was for me, I felt like I needed to make a big step. You know, like I, I knew I was, you know, in order for me to, I guess, authenticate my faith, it needed to come in the form of like, w show up, you know, don't just claim, show up. So for me, that meant hijab. And that was a real big deal because at that time, I could count the amount of hijabis I knew. It was a very small number. And my family, of course, was like, my mom, especially, she was very worried because, you know, safety concerns, but also, you know, the typical concerns, a lot of people have marriage and this and that. See, I was going to say, yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to ask you about your family's response, mm -hmm. you know, more than the community itself, because I think that's another shared immigrant experience mm -hmm. where young women who decide or choose to start wearing hijab, especially in a family where other women may not be wearing hijab, um, they get pushback. And it is along those exact lines, safety reasons, meritability, mm -hmm. if you will. And and maybe in even in, in some families, like you're getting too extreme. Yes, absolutely. All of those. Okay. All of those were, okay. were what I was yeah. dealing with at the time. And I, you know, I remember, um, alhamdulillah, again, you know, my father, Allah yarhamhu, he was my champion because everybody else was really, it's not that they were against me, but they were yeah. discouraging me. Right. They felt like I was making a premature decision that was going to impact my entire life and that I was still, um, I could still be, you know, Muslim and practicing but in other ways, you yeah. know, and not not so outwardly. Right. Whereas he really was, he always had that personality type of, if you want to do it and you want to commit to it, I'll support you, especially if it's something virtuous. He would never stand in your way. So I think he saw that this was my decision and, and my conviction was strong. And alhamdulillah, he, he really did champion me and he gave me the strength to do it. And I remember the first day, I mean, a lot, you know, he shows you signs. So I decided because it was such a, it wasn't a very common thing that I saw that I needed to be in an environment where I felt like I wouldn't be the weird one. So I decided to go to Berkeley <laughs> and that was my kind of way of embracing the hijab is I felt like if I could go somewhere where I wouldn't be 
stared at and looked at and, you know, kind of looked at as being bizarre because there were so many other things to look at, then maybe I could do this. So I went to Berkeley and I actually went to a, one of those Indian fabric stores right off of university. I'm sure you know all of them. There's a lot of them there. And I just walked in and I asked um, them to cut me a square of fabric. Like it was literally, that's my process. It's so funny when you think about it now. So I asked them just, just do a square. And then, I, you know, I had fringes. It was, there was no sewing, nothing. Thing. And I folded it into like a triangle and I tell everybody, like, I just put it on like babushka style. <laughs> I, uh, I tied it in the front, you know, so I look like a nice little old Russian woman, I old guess. But, <laughs> because there were no pins, there was nothing. <laughs> this was like, so I tell like young yeah. Muslim women now, I'm like, you have no idea how easy you have it. Like yeah. we had no tutorials, you just had to figure <laughs> things out. But my, um, I did that because I felt like, okay, Berkeley is very diverse. There's a lot of eclectic people here. I'm going to blend in. You're going to blend right in. And Allah, subhanAllah, I walked out of the Indian store, you know, obviously, you know, it's intimidating with my hijab. And as soon as I came around the corner, this black brother, I'll never forget, he saw me and he was beaming and he just looked at me and he said, Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> and that was it for me. It was like immediate acceptance and I just felt really, you, you're going to be fine. And yeah. alhamdulillah, I mean, my hijab style definitely improved after that. But um, I showed up to school, you know, the next day and the same sister who had advised me almost a year before to wear hijab was one of the first people I saw. And I just felt like subhanAllah, she may have also been a seed because, you know, she she put an idea in my mind that yeah. I wasn't, you know, at the time ready to accept. But Allah was proving to me that. Right. So there's also a theme of like how seeds flourish or grow later. Yeah, right, for absolutely. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, to borrow something Omar just said, you know, a while back about putting a pin in something, you talked about your family's response or especially from your, your mother, Allah mm -hmm. and perhaps other females in your family. I think that that's something that maybe we can touch on later when we talk sure. about parenting and something I know Omar will appreciate. But while you were speaking, I don't know why, mm -hmm. you know, again, a random course of events in your brain right so um i literally had to look it up because i want to quote it exactly but the lyric from father and son mm -hmm. you cat stevens came yeah. to mind it's not time to make a change just sit down take it slowly you're still young that's mm -hmm. your fault there's so much you have to go through. So, so like, wow. that's the, that's, the, it's from that place, I think, yes. that a lot of parents push back on things like that. It's exactly kind of echoed here. I, I mean, I love that song. We could probably do a, just a <laughs> dissection, like a tafsir of the of, song when we're talking lyrics. about parenting. Yeah. Just, <laughs> no, that's, it's so true. But, it's true. It always yeah. comes from love because yeah. you worry, you right. know? And so I knew that and I, I understood, especially because the way that the advice was given wasn't, it wasn't personal right. to them. It right. was. It wasn't anger. It wasn't like, oh, I'm betrayed by this decision. It was a true concern for my well-being and my future and my the prospects of how this would maybe impact my life. So I understood that. But I think, alhamdulillah, when Allah and I, I, anybody who's had a conversion or this type of experience knows, sure. th it's just beyond you. Like there's something else in control. Correct. And that's what I felt. Like I can't stop this. I can't, There's no way this is going to stop. Mm. I'm. I'm also glad because you're talking about your. Dad. Dad, because I'm I'm a dad, but as a dad, yeah. I, you may not even know that when you talk about your dad, you're helping us dads because then that gives us hope for our kids, Absolutely. right? It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, Marshall, I'm glad you mentioned that because it's true that I think sometimes as parents we forget the impact that we have because in the moment, you know, we're, we're, we're worried. We have fear. There's all these other drives, but in hindsight, children, I feel all of us have, have that experience, right? In hindsight, we always appreciate those things that our parents told us to do or told, not, told us not to do because we saw the wisdom. But in the mo in the time, it's difficult for both of them for different reasons, right? The father mm -hmm. or the mother is mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm the bad guy or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to lose uh, them if I don't, you know, if I don't do this. And then the child obviously is, is struggling. But I think you're right that inshallah, you know, I hope any father listening to this knows that when you do things with love and especially when you're guiding to something virtuous is the right course, you'll always have success, inshallah. 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 Um, let's talk a little about 1996 and, and <laughs> a, a, the place that is definitely dear to uh, all of us, mm -hmm. I think, uh, which is Zaytuna Institute. But maybe even before Zaytuna Institute, you're mm -hmm. talking about Actually, yeah. um, Hayward. Right. So let's talk a little about that and what that experience <laughs> was like discovering Zaytuna in its form sure. uh, in 1996. And I want you to know why you, and, and no pressure, but, yeah. you know, we have uh, unwittingly, and just by virtue of doing this for 10 years, 
had so many different people on who share their experiences with Zaytuna Institute that we've sort of shed light on this beautiful tapestry that right. is Zaytuna and its progression. So you're contributing to that. To well, that I'm honored. Beautiful tapestry. <laughs> and so. even between us, we have our own <laughs> versions for, of, for sure. of that. Well, I'm so. excited to yeah. hear those versions as well. No, I. So my story is really interesting for a couple yeah. of reasons, but I kind of stumbled upon Zaytuna Institute. It wasn't as graceful as many may, may assume um, because of my, you know, history with the actual institute and now with the college. But basically what happened was prior to um, me even knowing about the classes that were happening at the famous ISS study, which I'm sure yeah. you all um, are familiar with, the, the strip mall, mm -hmm. I was doing halakas in Berkeley, at UC okay. Berkeley. And so I, um, I can't, let's just say I came through a different path in Islam. It wasn't the traditional path. I won't, I won't get into labels, but I was on a different trajectory. And yeah. I was doing these halakas for the sisters in Berkeley at one of the like, sisters' homes. She would open up her home. And so every week we were kind of getting together. And one day I drove up to the house and I see a couple of the sisters like on their way out and I'm like hey what's going on are we going to meet and they're like actually there's this teacher who's teaching uh, at Hayward in Hayward and we want to go check out his classes and I was like oh really yeah. and I was like who Imam Hamza Yusuf so his name in the circles that I was in was shared but it wasn't shared in a positive light right. let's just say that so I my alarm bells went on I'd love to because no no because I think this is important and, yes. and you don't have to get into specifics but sure. an another thing that we have again unwittingly shed light on throughout the years we've been doing this is people who came of age mm -hmm. in the 90s and when I say came of age, I mean like forming their Islamic identities went through almost you know, identical yeah, experiences, exactly, right? <laughs> right. So let's just call it. I mean, if I could venture a guess, sure. like movement Islam, yes, was kind of your totally. Cup of tea. That was my cup. And that of was tea. your flavor. That was absolutely <laughs> my flavor, and I was drinking it by the gallons. Okay, let's okay. just say, yeah, like, yeah. it was such a big part of my identity that. Same. People knew. I was in right. circles where people knew of my activism. And so when I heard his name, my alarm bells went on. And I joke about it now, but honestly, that's where my mind was. I was on a mission to go to mission because that's where it was <laughs> <laughs> to basically do reconnaissance for who I don't know. But that wasn't that wasn't even important. Yeah. I needed to go check this person out and uh, maybe catch him in a, in a moment or, or try to call him out. I don't know. I just felt like I had, right. I had a mission. Yeah. So I actually followed have something in your repertoire that perhaps you could use to, to like dissuade people from going there. Totally. You know, I, so I totally feel you. Yeah. That, that was my mission. That's so right. I, I yeah. followed these girls, got in the car. We went straight to a, um, this little, again, strip mall cars packed, you know, anyway, so I'm just like, oh, I'm going to go in there and, and, you know, do what I have to do. I walk in and it's, mashallah, so many people. You have to go through the brothers in order to get to the sister's side. So I have to walk through all these people. It's just jam-packed, like sardines. They're literally packed in there. So I find a little spot and I'm just sitting there like, you know, scheming. I have like a whole plan. Right. I don't even know what, <laughs> but I'm like, no, no. oh, I'm here, right? So I'm sitting there and subhanAllah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I Sheikh Hamza at that time was doing the Sira class. So he is in full-blown like Sira mode. And I've never seen a grown man up until that point, never in my life, cry for the, the Prophet ﷺ. Yeah. And he just w was weeping. Like he was telling the story, but he couldn't get past the story without crying. So... I felt it. I felt the absolute turning of my heart because I just, and I, I, you know, Shamsa knows the story and he laughs because he thinks it's so funny. But I sat there and I just looked at him and I was like, this is not the face of a liar. I don't know who yeah. this man is, but whatever I've heard about him cannot be true mm -hmm. because what I'm feeling is real. And I've, I've never felt this before you know i was practicing islam for maybe two years prior to that i had read i did a lot but i never felt that i never felt the power of that type of a transformative experience yeah. and so when i tell him the story uh when i told him the story for the first time he said you're the daughter you know i've said no omar you had an omari experience because i went there the same way i said omar went to the falls <laughs> i'm like hoping to maybe al yeah. you know attack or do something but my heart was completely flipped and alhamdulillah, like I, I, it was still, a, you know, a faith crisis, I, I would say, because I had to reconcile everything yeah. I was doing for two years prior. And 
it was it really threw me for a loop. So I kept coming, and I, by, at so that point, I was hooked. This is 1996. 1996. Okay. Okay. I started coming weekly. Like yeah. I was there front row and center. You couldn't. You could not. And I was bringing so, people. So no, <laughs> just you know, if I could. You know, sure. sort of camel back on what you've been talking about with my own experiences. And I think you raise a really good point and something I've learned through years of experience as well, which is tell the mentors in your life these stories mm -hmm. of how they've changed your life. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, especially in like, you know, it, our ethos that's mm -hmm. sort of shy or, you know, not shunned, but, you know, it's, it's you know, you, you're shy to do it or sure. it's frowned upon or what have you because it's seen as praising someone to their face. But... I think it's so powerful to do that. And and I say that because I, I, I share a very cathartic experience of of telling Sheikh Hamza exactly what you shared, Tomorrow. meaning in terms of the transformative experience you had with him mm. and what that meant in your life at that time when you heard him. And, you know, you know, he does his usual bit, but I mean, just even sh sharing that story was cathartic for me. Mm -hmm. Well, while you were sharing that, I just couldn't help but reflect on that. Because the first time I hear Sheikh Hamza is, is, is Isna 1994. Wow. So by then, so I'm thinking by 19, 1996, I mean, Sheikh Hamza's trajectory is already mm -hmm. right on the rise. So he's a well, he's someone well known outside of even the Bay Area, of, you know, by 1996, for sure. But yeah, 1994, I remember exactly sitting in the audience with my pen and paper, and I was there to, I loved how you called it reconnaissance, <laughs> because that's why I was there. Like, okay, I've heard all these things about this, you know, now the bit like deviant person, mm -hmm. and I'm going to hear, I'm going to record it and take it back to base. <laughs> <laughs> Where's base? I don't There's know. No base. There's the no base is in your head. Yeah, exactly. So um, thank you for sharing that beautiful story. Uh, and the fact that, again, that you told him that story mm -hmm. and shared it with him. So I think it's a powerful lesson there to tell your mentors what they, what they've been to you and what they've, what they've how they've I mean, impacted you. He changed my life. Yeah. I've had, I had multiple um, openings because of the classes that I yeah. was suddenly attending, you know, you, cause you don't know. I mean, we never studied diseases of the heart. So I realized so much of my worship for those two years. Oh man, I had, I was riddled with diseases because I wasn't taught those things. I was taught to outwardly focus on myself and be very active Activism. and to police other people. There was a lot of policing. Like oh, I yeah. remember I have friends who joke with me that I was like really not tolerable person at that time. <laughs> they were scared of you. They were, they were terrified yeah. of me yeah. because if I, <laughs> You. No, like I police their prayers. So, yeah, you know, like yeah. the way that we would, were taught to pray, if they didn't pray that way, I would call them out and all the blah. It's just, it was terrible. So he, he brought me to a point where it was total inward focus. Yeah. And that was transformative. Like, MashaAllah. The rest yeah. is history. <laughs> okay. Say. Well, that's, that's probably that's probably a good place for us to kind of pivot to yeah. our, our, uh, our our main topic. <laughs> of course. I could literally sit here and talk to you about yeah. this probably for the next two hours. So. I, I agree. I so, think we have a lot of to share. I, I love how Omar keeps us on track. So that's <laughs> one of the, what is it? Um, yeah. Omar plays a significant role Mashallah. in keeping the show on track because I have a tendency to get into the weeds like this and just get... <laughs> to stay in there. <laughs> so I'm anyway, doing that. We'll, we'll come back to it. So yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, I think you've already just in sharing your experiences touched on a lot of sort of like things that, that are significant or related to the issue of parenting. I, I think as we look at it, the way we sort of compartmentalized it, one, we, we wanted to sort of talk about sort of external challenges mm. that I think a lot of young parents yeah. feel or parents of young children feel. And I think one of those challenges, first and foremost, and I, I think my ears perked up when we heard your biography, sorry, mm -hmm. um, was the challenges of social media and the, and the damages of sort of the internet in general. So if you want to maybe touch mm. on that, I mean, I think that's certainly something that, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction as well, like the world is so different than the world that we knew when we were growing up. Yeah. Yeah. And just like more on even on a personal note, it feels like at a high level, uh, and we'll get into kind of each of these topics individually, but it feels like, you know, we grew up here and we had some good experiences growing up and some maybe so things good. we were like, okay, we could do that. We want to do that a little different for our kids. Absolutely. Right. And so we we're raising our kids with reacting to that, that experience. Right. But what they're dealing with is completely different. Is. Absolutely. And so only third quarter of the game, if you will, like things are already in motion and you start realizing like, so for me, I want my kids to go to a masjid where there's people like them. Mm -hmm. So that was my focus was like, keep them away from the, the mosque that 
the khutbas in Urdu and only, you know, take them to this. Or deeply segregated, for example. I mean, As we an can example. just be honest. Yeah, but, yeah, well, yeah. But, but the bigger, the bigger yeah. point is yeah. that, like, my things that I'm trying to solve for right. are actually not the big problems that they're dealing with yeah. today. Absolutely. And Absolutely. and then that wake up, that's a that's a moment. For me, I remember even before I had children, but I remember certainly when my first daughter was born, just a baby. And I was just thinking, you know, as I was sort of imagining myself as a father mm -hmm. when she grew up and she, as she grew older, I'm so confident. Like, I'm American. I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm going to be just this. like her. <laughs> I got this. Like, she's not going to have a dad who was like born and raised in India, right. like I'm going to be so hip and with it, that gave me almost a sense of like false confidence in the fact sure. that I would be able to relate to my daughter as she became a teenager. Because like Omar yep. said, their challenges, their right. world completely is different. completely different. A hundred percent. I mean, the discussions I have with parents are, the, everybody's in agreement that we had our eye on the wrong target, right? And it beca it's because we're projecting, right? We have cultural, uh, generational differences, cultural differences, and a lot of the rapid changes that have happened just in our lifetime have, are so overwhelming, we can't keep up. So I think a lot of parents feel this uh, same, that they're waking up to the, the fact that they've been thinking uh, about the wrong problems. So recently, I did an event um, with Imam Tahir where we were addressing these issues called battling jahiliya uh, uh, the theme was of the event but i outlined three areas that i think are really important for parents to keep in mind the first is toxic culture you know like how do we define that and that's where all those external aspects that you brought up are really important like social media i mean i was doing there's a great pew research study that came out just in the beginning of this year on parenting struggles where 40 percent of parents are really overwhelmed and a lot of them have to do with exactly these things they're concerned their main concern is mental health because the numbers are just soaring beyond anything and it's unprecedented the, the the rise in mental health issues and so then comes well where why you know how did this all come about and a lot of it yes does stem from exposure to these toxic elements that are, you know, infecting uh, our children through through social media and through media in general, right? I think okay. media has become so powerful that um, and and youth as we all, I mean, even I think if we look back on our experiences with um, the escapes. Uh, that that youth have, you know, a lot of for for my time, I remember it was television, it was music, right, film, yes, but those mm -hmm. three pre-internet era were huge escapes that I used as coping, you know, sports tools for boy, for boys, <laughs> yeah, sports, generally yeah. for boys, but yeah, right, to, 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 back then, anyway. yeah, no, I, I, yeah, when I think of my brothers, absolutely, that was that was their way of, of you know dealing with what the challenges of, of the youth experience but for me because we didn't have these other um, outlets you yeah. know also that was also an immigrant experience like as you may know w girls were not given a lot of opportunities outside of the home whereas boys were so we yeah. were limited in that way as well but anyhow when I think of that being just sort of natural um, those natural ways that teens uh, try to process their emotions for example right okay. so I just actually had um, a really interesting discussion with a mother and teen because the teen daughter listens to a lot of music. Okay. And the mother was just like, oh, you know, she was worried because it's AirPods and the ear, all this. So she's looking at this like, this is going to damage her brain. And, and so she's trying to come at that perspective. And the girl, she's just not hearing it. And then during our discussion, I kind of just started to relate to her. And I said, you know, I would want to know what lyrics she's listening that she's resonating with. There's something there. And I'm not kidding. As we were speaking, the girl just starts to cry, like her just tears just started streaming because she couldn't tell, like, I guess, you know, they hadn't had that heart to heart yet because it was more like, you know, it was a, yeah. it was a power dynamic up until that point where now um, she was able to share that she has so much pain buried because of other issues going on that the music is a way of processing, coping, processing. and coping. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, um, something that, that was really eye-opening eye for the mother. But I think these are the types of things that parents who, when their target is off, they're missing. So that was just a really powerful experience, you know, yeah. watching the mother and daughter finally having, you know, a, a mutual understanding about what was going on. That was beyond just the power dynamic, you know, or the power struggle mm -hmm. of between, which is very typical in the teenage years, as we all know. So it was really powerful to see that. But I think this is where our generation, you know, because of the fact that we were dealing with, or we were taught to be dutiful, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, to really focus on education, that those were the targets that were we were raised with. So I think a lot of us, you know, ended up 
from what I just listening to to different people that that became the same targets, but then we're kind of missing the bigger picture. And this is where, you know, Sayyidina Ali, uh, the famous quote that he has about raising your children, he specifically says, do not raise your children the way you were raised because they are being raised in a different time. So he's mm. actually drawing our attention to the, to the generational difference that will, that should impact your parenting and make you not a, you know, rinse and repeat, I'm just going to repeat what happened to me, a parent, which is a very passive way of parenting, but an active parent, which means yeah. you got to be awake. You got to know what's going on with your children. You have to know, you know, what their concerns are and not just project um, the way that you were raised. I mean, I think if someone's like taking notes of, for the remainder <coughs> of this episode, I think that's like a really important point to underscore, which is this idea that as parents, sometimes we tend to miss the target mm -hmm. and to like focus on things or areas like the mother in the anecdote that you shared was more concerned about the volume and the decibel, you know, right. whatever of the, of the music, as opposed to the question that you posed, which is what's the lyrics? Like, what are you actually listening to? Exactly. So this is how we kind of, I think as parents, we tend to miss the mark where you're focusing on minor details as opposed to the more sort of broader and, 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 picture. And, but there's also reality that things have changed at a, like lightning speed. If we thought, we were different than our parents in terms of just challenges and, and the way the world is, right? I mean, it's exponential at this point, right? right. Yeah. And I, I think a story that you were mentioning off air, I, I think is really... To really uh, wait, which one about Guns N' Roses? Yeah, Guns N' yeah, yeah, Roses. Yeah. No, so in terms of how things have changed, we were, you know, I grew up in a pretty traditional Muslim house, yeah, but I also escaped with mu the, th the, the things you mentioned, you know, TV, film, music, and sports. Those mm -hmm. are my escapes in, in small town America, but we also had very traditional family values. But I grew up listening to, and my brother too, you know, rock and roll, and I'll give you an example, Guns N' Roses, right? Mm -hmm. I listened to Guns N' Roses. I loved Guns N' Roses. I had their music on repeat all the time, but I never wanted to be them. I right. never like wanted to be Axl Rose or follow his politics or dress like him or learn about relationships through him all these it was just like the music that was the extent of it maybe the mm -hmm. music videos i think what's different now is an example of how drastically things have changed if somebody's following a musician you know pick rihanna whoever it is it's not just about the music it's about the clothes it's about her politics it's about her personality mm -hmm. it's about her perfume it's about the list of her relationships yeah. and and the the people consuming her as a brand or consuming all of that so it's it's just much more influential Absolutely. Um, than maybe what we were dealing with for and sure. so again yeah. it has we have to recognize that yeah. if our kids are listening even the way they listen to music has changed compared to how we listen to it yeah. so that's an example of a moving target a hundred percent. And I, I mean, I, 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 I'm thinking of all these different experiences I've had where this same issue has come up repeatedly because the parent can't understand, you know, our generation cannot understand how their child's entire identity has been hijacked by a genre or a type yeah. of, or a musician. They don't get it because like you said, we were, um, we, we, we didn't have that much exposure. And I think, you know, social media has definitely leveled the playing field in terms of what we consider to be a figure of authority, I guess, or influence, right? Uh, because it, now it's it's a popularity contest. So it's at a certain point, right, in time, in order to have that type of influence, uh, you had to reach a certain level of expertise or, you know, you, there was a lot of, I think, effort on a person's, uh, in a person's personal journey before they were able to influence the masses to the scale right. that we're seeing now, right? You, you n Not everybody had that uh, opportunity. You know, you had to really reach. Now, anybody, if they just wanted to, or they're very good at marketing, they could put the, put themselves in that position of suddenly being incredibly influential, yeah. which is very dangerous. And it's not even musicians. I mean, you know, Andrew Tate comes to mind. Right. I mean, you know, regardless of how you feel about him or whatever, I mean, we, we can talk about that perhaps if that's, a, <laughs> if that's something you do want to uncover. But nonetheless, I mean, this idea of influencers, mm -hmm. right? Where, like you said, in the past, it was a meritocracy. It was yes. like a true meritocracy where truly the creme de la creme rose to the top. And those you knew the, influen the influential people within a certain field or genre or what have you. Now, because, again, because of the sort of nature of social media, um, and if you're sharp, savvy, and mm -hmm. if you have the right marketing idea, strategy, or what have you, um, you suddenly now are on equal footing as the creme de la creme experts that you exactly. that we should be relying on. And, and this actually leads, and this is you know something Omar and I 
wanted to talk also talk about, which is I think it's a real crisis of epistemology, mm-hmm. where what are the what are the sort of sources of knowledge and uh, truths that right. our children absorb? Yeah, it's really it's a- funny because I have a ten year old and she's she's hilarious. Like she's definitely a, a, f- a really fun personality. So I kind of say this smiling, but. She'll, sometimes she'll be like, just Google it, just Google it. And I'm like, hang on, I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you the answer soon. She's like, just Google it. Right. And so there's like an impatience there. And there's also this idea that Google's going to give her the answer. And now it's, of course, chat GBT, right? Oh, so it's yeah. like next level. But that undermines the idea of, okay, you have to actually know what you're talking about. Right. Uh, or parents and adults who've been through it actually may be able to tell you, give yeah. you, impart that wisdom s- on and, you and versus and just like Googling it. Thank right? you. Because right. what, what you're sharing, what you will share on any XYZ topic is not just information, which is what, which is what Google will give you. Yeah. Right. You'll interject it with your own personal journey, your mm-hmm. own personal narrative. Uh, anecdote w- attached to that story. So it, it becomes a truly transformative moment for the child to learn that about their father, mm-hmm. as opposed to just the information that they want to get, which is, hey, see, Hey, Google. Yeah, but on top of that, when you Google something, you kind of get the information is you're not really going in with a nobody's humbling you you're you're almost no, fine it's yeah, like social sure. media There's you're finding that. the information yeah. that so it's a double no, it's, a dub, it's a double yeah. whammy right well what you brought up i think is really important about undermining like you're being undermined in a way and i think we have to really open our eyes to see that these mediums are dangerous for multiple reasons sometimes parents only focus on time usage right or exposure to screens and the way that these things are affecting right. the brain or the eyes and they get very hung up on that stuff and that kind of that's not an effect Effective premise, you know, to really uh, argue uh, akin um, to the volume level of, right. of, 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 ear, of the earpods. Exactly, right. exactly. It's the same thing. Yeah. So the target of or how we're trying to Correct. really influence our children to help them understand our concern is not effective because those arguments just don't really land well when everywhere everybody's on these devices for hours and hours on end and and they can do all these comparisons. Well, like so and so. So those are just ineffective arguments, right? Mm-hmm. But if we actually talk about what you're talking about, which is I think a much more effective you know, idea to share, which is how do you know that what Google produces is actually true? You know, uh, like, let's talk about the the quality of the content, you know, not just the quantity, but the quality of the content. Right. And that's where I think because our youth have not been really engaged, you know, critically to think about these things, it becomes this battle because parents, they tire after a short time, right? It's like we get exhausted. if As soon as we see some, uh, you know, uh, like pushback, we perceive that as being in subordination or, or disrespect or whatever. So then it becomes this whole power dynamic. But we're really so thinking, true. like, let's think logically. These children are not convinced by your argument. So how about you approach it a different angle, which is, do you do you know that the that we have a, 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 you know, a serious crisis of information being whether or not it's true, like if it's verified, yeah. did you know that? So even if you're Googling something, how do you know the sources are, and did you know that the, what the Quran says about checking sources, mm-hmm. right? That right. you actually have to go through a huge vetting process. And that's where my role as your parent that tr- you should trust, that's my role, which I'm going to be the one who vets the information for you. So it's much better to go through my filter yep. and listen to me right. than to just trust the this, you know, yeah. some engine, search engine that's going to yield a lot of results, but whether or not it's good information, valuable information, is it to your detriment, all of that stuff you can't discern at your age. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. So this, yeah. And that's thing, what I was saying when I said a, a true crisis of epistemology. Yes. I mean, it was a, it was a fancy of, way of saying it, but, but it, exactly what you're saying, which is it robs you of all of the other things and not to mention the dangers and the pitfalls of that quote unquote information that they're exactly. getting being, you know, what, what are the sources? What, is it misinformation? Is it disinformation? Exactly. Is it is it harmful? And so on. This I mean, is where, you know, when I mentioned toxic uh-huh. culture, yeah. I, I actually have a list of what I what that Please. looks like. Yeah. So what's toxic culture? Well, toxic culture promotes first and foremost self-worship, right? Which mm-hmm. is what we're seeing. We're seeing this explosion of narcissism, vanity, this constant desperate, like attention seeking behavior, for whether it's TikTok or anywhere else, you just see it. People are willing to push so many lines just to get be the next viral hit, right? And um, I don't know if you saw that that uh, 60 Minutes uh, episode where they asked American, you know, students or youth what they wanted to aspire to, you know, be in the future. And the vast majority of them said influencer, <laughs> social media influencer. Wow. They did the exact same poll in China. And this was the whole thing was about how TikTok is, you know, Byte, um Dance, which owns TikTok in China and in the US. They have very different uh, ways of using their software, uh, software 
the for, for the different is design completely entirely different completely for but Chinese what, but what did they yield they yield astronauts scientists doctors so they were doing this like wow what's going on with American and and you know Western youth all they care about is social media influencing it's because um, you know that it's just it, it is what what's shaping our their understanding of, of what's you know virtuous it's just to be wealthy to be popular to be famous that's what they think is the best goal so self-worship and then the second is risky behavior so we're seeing this also heavily promoted in this culture right to just you know uh, experiment experimentation is a word that our youth know because it relates to drugs substance as well as sexual behavior and now in this world of exploration and uh, you know fluidity right. it becomes even more enticing right like it's all good it's all about your feelings and urges so that and then hypersexualization is a very serious problem and um, if we're not again waiting Waking up to what's happening, I'm sure you guys are, are paying attention to the yeah. to the public square of of you know what's happening with with uh, right. hypersexualization. I mean, I can children. just share anecdotally with regards to the two last points you just raised: hypersexualization and uh, risky behavior. Mm -hmm. I think right was yes. the second. Just an again, anecdotally, so I don't have the statistics to prove this, but just again, I have two young daughters, uh, or I have two daughters. They're not they're not so young anymore. College and 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 you know about to go to high school, and the number of people that they know. Mm -hmm. that identify themselves as homosexual, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, he um, uh, heterosexual, mm -hmm. straight, as we would say in today's parlance, is, is the minority now. Mm -hmm. Vast majority of people that they know, at minimum, are bi or right. bi-curious. So risky behavior, uh, and even if it's not that, of uh, experimentation. Absolutely. Right, where you're, first of all, dude, excuse the expression, <laughs> dude, you're, you're, you're 14. Yeah. What do you know about the, like your sexuality for the rest exactly. of your life. So give me a break here. Uh, right. Let alone the, again, the fact that that is the, I mean, again, that's what they're exposed to. So right. it, it's appealing. It's cool. It's, there's an attraction to it. And it's know? everywhere. It's everywhere. That's the it's thing. Ubiquitous. It's so ubiquitous because yeah, all of their social media influencers, all of these celebrities that they've been told to look up to, that's what they sing about. That's the films that they do. Like what was the, the very popular HBO uh, show, which I couldn't, I couldn't believe this was such a big hit. All the teens were raging about euphoria. Euphoria. That show Show is pretty much pornography. Right. I mean, it shows everything that you can imagine. And that is what teens want to watch. And they're taught that in order to be relevant, like you said, I mean, I remember in art when we were younger, we, if you wanted to be relevant, you know, you had to maybe attend parties and push the boundaries with alcohol and drugs, sure. right? Now, it's if you want to be relevant, you have to be bi-curious. And That's I right. have some horror stories. I had just quickly a mother a Muslim family come up to me a couple of years back. Actually, it was before pandemic, I think. So this was right around maybe 2019, 2020. And this was an, during Eid. 12 year old daughter, Muslim mother, and she, it was in Eid. It was like literally Eid. She came up to me, she's like, I need to talk to you. And I said, Okay, is everything okay? She said, My daughter, she's 12 years old. She goes to a public school, Muslim girl. Her friends, this is the challenge. Her friends told her that you cannot know that you're truly heterosexual until you first experiment with your same gender. And then if that doesn't like work with you, then you'll know. So in order to validate your heterosexuality now, you have to experiment and then you can draw that line. Right. So she wow. actually, this 12 year old told her mom that she thinks she needs to kiss a girl in order to know if she's a lesbian. Because that was what her peer group told her. So this is the kind of indoctrination, which is another um, part of, you know, I think the struggles that a, a lot of us um, are observing, that you yeah. know, they're being indoctrinated by, by a lot of these forces. But just quickly. Continuing, uh, yeah, please, yeah, with the toxic just, culture. Yeah, toxic culture. So the next one was disrespect of authority um, and then the loss of purpose. And disrespect of authority includes all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Parents, sure. educators. Um, we saw what happened with the riots during, you know, the the BLM protests, which a lot of it relating to the police. I mean, we can all agree we need police reform, but I think when you take such a strong stance against all people in authority positions, politicians, police, I think it really sends a very dangerous message to youth that just do away with all of that because it's a hierarchical. And this comes against from, from post-modernity, right? Which is sure. the world is completely divided in, into, you know, these hierarchies and you're either in the oppressed class or the oppressor class. And that's how our youth are being, that's how they're being taught to see everything in the world. And that leads to the undermining of anything that they, anyone who's in a position of authority. I mean, we 
saw, I don't know if you were following the Stanford case that happened this past week with a judge who was speaking on campus. Yeah. yeah, it was, I mean, these types of things are now unfolding on college campuses and they're doubling down even though they're going against the very um, rules of their own universities. They're being so emboldened that, you know, if you disagree with someone or you see them as somehow a threat or an oppressor, that you're allowed to challenge them. But, you know, just a, an everyday sort of level, this all actually comes into the home as well. Yeah. yeah. So parents are now seen as, you know, you're, um, you know, you're being, you're, so, you're, you're so strict, you're oppressing me, right. you're, you're ageist. This is now, no, this is the accusation oh, no. level right. that parents, you're yeah. ageist because you don't give me autonomy. Me, you yeah. don't. Um, you don't think I am capable of, you know, making certain decisions right. for myself. So a lot of this is being, you know, promoted in mm -hmm. the culture around. Mm -hmm. So we can't really blame the youth entirely when it's everywhere. So and, I mean, I'm glad you raised the Stanford case because you know it, it actually kind of harkens back to something we did talk about when mm -hmm. you were sharing your own personal journey. Sure, taking you back to that college event that you mm -hmm. attended where you spoke out against yes. someone who was vociferously anti-Muslim and Islamophobic and so on. Right. So, because I couldn't help but think, I, I was thinking about it along these exact lines, even when you shared that story, mm -hmm. because I, you know, it, because I think something we forget is that as young people, the tendency to isolate ourselves or not expose ourselves to viewpoints that are different mm -hmm. or that are, an, you know, antagonizing to our, even our belief system, that's become sort of the culture in college campuses now. Oh, totally. Safe spaces. Safetyism. Um, safetyism, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, coddling of the American, mind. American I mean, mind. I mean, Jonathan Hay talks about this. Right. And this whole idea of uh, fragility versus, Absolutely. you know, uh, infragility. So uh, it fascinated me. So how do you reconcile, on the one hand, you know, you want to expose your children to, or I think young people especially should be exposed to viewpoints that are different. But mm -hmm. where do you draw that line where it's okay to be exposed to it even if it's a viewpoint that is, again, like as Muslims, something that is completely contrary or contrarian to our own faith tradition. Sure. And I think that's a very fair question. I'm glad yeah. you raised it because I certainly don't want to um, confuse anyone in terms of, you know, how we as Muslims should respond in these types of situations. Thank you. And and it, right. I'm, I'm sorry not to cut you off, but I mean, because I, I want you to maybe incorporate this as well, because sure. what you were talking about, for example, contempt of authority and so on, right? you know, it reeks of Marxism, right? Absolutely. Yeah. But conversely, at the same time, mm -hmm. and this is something else I've at least identified, there's almost been this pendulum shift now or as a response mm -hmm. to go to the opposite extreme, which is like, basically fascism yeah which well, is right. let's because we could talk about you know we talked a like a lot about the the red flags to look out for the mm -hmm. dangers right and we could probably spend hours talking about the dangers of instagram versus tiktok you know or uh the dangers of streaming services mm -hmm. and the kind of content that's like so we could probably go there but to, to your point purpose i think it's a good time to talk to talk now about kind of the parent to parental response yeah. to some of these things and because our generation, again, you know, we had parents who didn't let their daughters go off to college. And so now we're like, we're not going to, we want to make sure our daughters sure. are able to experience like some, some of that, that they may be, or, you know, so we're just trying to, again, the rebound effect. And then sure. to your point, Perez, it, it, it ties into like parental styles, bulldozing yeah. and helicopter parents and all that. Yeah. Stuff. So, and I'd love to, yeah, get into that as well. But I mean, I, I think we are, I mean, I think you're right. We didn't get into the weeds of like the dangers of Instagram versus YouTube. We could, versus, but we, we have could, just but we, to, we, I think <laughs> no, the no, point was made, right? But I think we're talking about, I think broader and right. more existential issues here. Sure. And so, like I said, I, while I agree with you about the harms of the kind of sort of Marxist uh, tendencies that we see um, among certain part of the, political spectrum. The response, unfortunately, from the other side right. is this embrace of fascism. And I think sure. that that's also, to me at least, equally troubling. Of course. And that's why we have to go back to, you know, what does civil discourse look like? And what uh, what is freedom of speech? Mm -hmm. And and really go back to our own, you know, the way that our, our government has, has uh, constructed itself in order to allow for people to be able to have an exchange of ideas respectfully and allow for people to also protest certain ideas, especially if they're dangerous. Mm -hmm. There you go. So I think we need that balance. And, you know, in the two examples that I offered, my own personal one, I think um, just to maybe mention this, we electively went to support someone who turned out to, <laughs> to yeah. basically, you know, come after us. So I felt like there was a, 
a total different scenario. Sure, sure. But if you know that you're going to listen to someone and you know their positions and political positions, right. I think, um, again, because we live in a civil society, we should go there willing to listen mm -hmm. and maybe question our presumptions and, and be fair. And that's what dialogue is, right? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think that's important. As far as parents and the way that parents can help their children navigate these things, I think it's very important for us to resume our position as what you mentioned in the very beginning of this entire uh, segment or this uh, episode, which is the hadith of the Prophet yeah, <laughs> If we're the shepherds, then we have to be shepherding. And shepherding requires being ahead of the flock. So we can't just let the flock run amok and then try to, you know, suddenly, you know, direct yeah. them. We, we should have been ahead all along. That's and right. so, it's like Omar's analogy of the third quarter. Yes. And only realizing that you're kind yeah. of behind. Yeah, hmm. so that's, I think, the, the answer is that yeah. if you're the one through which this information is processed with or, you know, the person who's helping them to see these differences and navigating them, then you're not going to have these really uh, extreme reactions. It's when we allow other people to influence our children beyond our influence that then we find ourselves undermined and we find all of these emotions taking hold of us. But it has to be an intellectual process. I, I, I also, I do think also because of modern day busyness, mm -hmm. you know, parents sometimes both outside the home, I think a lot of parents kind of realize stuff yeah. as their kids are in junior high and high school. And I think it was my sister, um, shout, shout out to Sam Samina for, <laughs> for, for, for saying this the other day. She's like, man, we should have just listened to the, 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 the saying of, is it uh, Hazrat Ali? Like, love your kids from age zero to seven. Absolutely, yeah. And the, or play with them and then teach them and then let them. Befriend them. And, and actually, if you think about it, that timing is actually, it actually aligns even Completely. with like modern day. Child development. Yeah, child development. Totally. Yeah. We, we, I, I mean, when I do parenting classes, we use these two hadith from Sayyidina Ali specifically. Yeah. Mm. The ones you just mentioned, which is play with them before seven. Yeah. Then you, um, you uh, teach them from 7 to 14, and 14 and beyond, you befriend them. Yeah. And that is a perfect model that aligns exactly with the needs of youth. Because yeah. in the early stages, they really just need a playmate. And you need to come down to the, their level and be able to engage in their world, go with, to their world, totally. uh, enter the world of imagination. And then you move into the phase of instruction, where you actually start to explain these things. So a lot of parents, for example, ask me, you mentioned you know, the uh, issue that your teenage or your daughters are experiencing on a college campus with just this explosion of sexual experimentation. So a lot of parents are concerned, like, when do we introduce these ideas? Like, well, in today's world, where your kids are probably already, they know far more than you think they do, I would say, you know, obviously uh, age appropriately, but right around that preteen, um, yeah. adolescence age is really important. But you have to be the vessel or the, the, the one who's, they're getting this information from. Because if you don't do it, which is where a lot of people, I think, put their own comforts before the demands and the needs that that we yeah. are in you know in this in this age um they your children will be influenced by other people and they'll start to that whole concept of their own sexuality and sexuality itself becomes tainted with a very and i'll just say it a very demonic lens that's because what that's what they're being introduced to by this toxic culture it 100%. is not i mean sexuality is a very beautiful thing in our dean where we, we have there's it's it's a very it's, it's not something that we look down upon it's something within the boundaries it's beautiful mm -hmm. but they're not being shown that even with respects to their own body and their own you know change into uh you know adulthood they're not being taught to see that as a beautiful transition because culturally we have a lot of other ideas that are very bizarre that are not rooted in our faith for example um with menstruation with girls like a lot of young girls have a very difficult time understanding that this is just a, a part of you know beautiful part of their creation mm -hmm. and to be embracing of it they're they're ta they're shamed and culturally speaking right yeah. because even their own mothers don't want to talk to them about it or their fathers you know it's suddenly this weird awkward thing so a lot of our generation parents i think are struggling cuz that those are the ways that these topics were introduced or maybe completely ignored in when in our experience right yeah. like a, who amongst us had a talk with the, about the birds and the bees with our parents no likely one. no one right <laughs> exactly but we suddenly have to have this very awkward conversation so that's where you know mm. i've done um coming of age talks in the community and a lot of times it's the parents who are like thank you so much i, I couldn't do this talk you know yeah. because uh, i think you, you nail uh, 
Go ahead. You, you nailed it. I mean, and borrowing from the statement of Sayyidina Ali, mm-hmm. uh, which is like 7 to 14. I mean, that's really that age that, that I think I'd love to spend a little bit more time on. Yes. Because you talked about it as the age or the era or the phase of instruction. Where's the place or where does discipline fit in, right? Because the stage of befriending comes later, right? Sure. And I think that oftentimes... And maybe this is to what Samina was trying to raise, which is like in that seven to 14 age uh, age bracket, we try to befriend them and we think that maybe that's the approach, forgetting that you also have the role of disciplinarian. So yeah, no, that's wow. a great question. Yeah. I'm glad you asked it because this draws us back to like our scholars, mashallah, they, they had so much insight into yeah. these topics. And, you know, if only we could, like Samina said, just go back <laughs> to the foundations, we, we wouldn't have these issues. But, um, you know, Imam al-Ghazali has a beautiful... Um, framework that he introduces. And I think it's really good for parents to know, educators to know, where he really touches on our nature tri- being triune, right? Mm. And he emphasizes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us different quwas, right? So we have the quwa al-aqliya, which is the rational faculty, quwa al-ghadabiyya, which is the emotional faculty, and quwa al shahwaniya mm-hmm. which is the appetitive faculty. And so then he goes on to describe giving analogies that are, I think, are very useful tools to teach children, which is you have been given a, this incredible mind that differentiates you from all of creation You're, to be able to process and think and speak and all of these things that we're doing abstract. This is an incredible part of your creation. The other part of your creation is what he likens to a hunting dog, right? And he says that the hunting dog is, you know, useful because you train it. You, you it dispatches, you dispatch it. It retrieves your hunt for you, and you train. It's trained. Without training our emotions, we become like rabid, you know, in in our emotions. And that's what you're seeing. This unhinged, triggered emotional states everywhere because we're not training the uh, hunting dog or that that part of us under the the, the rational mind. We're not um, understanding emotions. You right. know, we're we're just reacting to them. And then the last part is he likens to a pig. That's where he right. says, if you don't take command over it, it will enslave you. Mm-hmm. So what we need to explain to our children is that the society and the culture that they're immersed in, because of, I mean, you could take it from an economical distru- you know, a direction, like you know, capitalism, and basically that th- that's what drives a lot of our market, right, is, is about profitability, that they want us to be in those states of in our animal states like the dog and the pig because we can we're we're easily herded you know but our dean calls us constantly to use our mind and so what do you prefer to be do you want to be a dog and a pig or would you rather be like a rational above the angels and above you know this is our potential so i feel like when you speak to children in this way what you're doing is you're giving them a really healthy way of understanding themselves. Mm. So then when you need to discipline, okay. you can direct them in the right way, right? But if it's just a matter of, you know, yelling and screaming and getting upset with them, then you're unhinged emotionally, mm. projecting that to them, and you're not going to get anywhere. So I feel like when we can really rationalize things with our children, then disciplining becomes much easier. Okay. Um, and you, you know, you have to First, though, work on yourself. So a lot of parents, what I've found, unfortunately, is because there's no manual for parenting, we're kind of sometimes surprised by sudden pregnancies and thrown into these issues, no, situations, I mean, right? All the all time. We're all sort of flying by the seat of our pants. Totally, I mean, learning on the job, ways, right? That's right, learning on the job, That sure. we didn't realize the how much uh, self-work we need to be doing in order to be effective. And if we're not doing that self-work, then we are going to have a much harder time. You know how they say on, when you get on a plane, you have to put your yes. own mask on first? <laughs> and that I, I think it. that don't, doesn't just apply in terms of safety. No. It applies in terms of taming the, the dog and the absolutely, pig too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Because uh, your your children are modeling uh, your behavior. So Thank if you're, you. That's a really adding important right? point. I mean, yeah. You're just so, yelling yeah. and, 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 and getting upset and easily becoming upset, easily becoming angered. Yeah. That means you don't have control of yourself, and why would you expect them to have control of themselves when you've never modeled it for them? They need it to be modeled. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you work on this, and that's why, you know, um, Imam al-Ghazali, I believe, he he considered tasqiyat al-nafs as a fard ayn. You Mm -hmm. have to be doing it lifelong. Mm -hmm. But how many of our parents have even taken the class or read a book on it? Nobody, very few people, unless they're really interested in these sciences, would not see these as as priorities because like you said we're working we're in the grind we got to get you know we got to make money and yeah. you know even in this pew research um study that was the primary concern for the parents um it, it's a really interesting study because 40 percent of them admitted to having all these issues of, you know and struggles then there was i think close to 80 percent that were very confident 
in their parenting abilities. And then another 40, so it's like, okay, yeah. you're, you're, you've got all these struggles, but you're way overconfident, mm -hmm. right? And then 40% that said, um, like 43% that said that they were just replicating the parenting practices that they, that they experienced. Right. So th there's no real, you know, active parenting or very little active parenting happening, I think. Sure. So then in your mind, then what, what should discipline look like? We've already like sure. identified, I mean, the areas to avoid. I mean, right, be un uh, unhinged, yelling, sure. screaming, et cetera. But what is, I mean, but at the same time, right, right. there is discipline. I think it's very important to have consequences laid out ahead of time. I really get upset when I see that uh, parents are arbitrarily just throwing, it's not a fair system. If you don't even know the consequences, fair system. Right? right? I like that. Of, of like your actions, like you don't, if you don't proceed, like for example, if you want your children to do something, they need to know the consequence of what happens when they don't do it. If you don't mention that up front, or you don't give them the clear like boundaries or whatever, all those um, important matters, then to arbitrate, that is, you know, tyranny to me, that is a uh, total abuse of power, right? Okay. And yeah. how your children are not going to trust you. So I think Clear communication is really important. Um, consequences have to be laid out. Also, there has to be a pathway to retribution. Like if your child, if you're not willing to also show compassion and forgiveness, you're going to harden their hearts. So if right. they make mistakes, you know, they do, let's say they, they break rule, uh, you know, for the fifth, sixth time in a week. You have a choice, you know, sh certainly I think discipline, uh, I mean, you should, you know, stick to your word. So if you're, you have a consequence, you got to see it through. Yeah. Otherwise, they're not going to respect you. But I do think that you can do that with compassion. So if that means withholding something, for example, that's fine, but you don't have to be ruthless about it. You know, like sometimes we don't even realize our tone, get your phone. You know, it's like, you don't have to say that. You can say, you know, I it, basically, this is your punishment, but I know it's going to be difficult for you. And during this time, I'm here for you. I'm here to support you. You've taken away whatever it is that, you know, you're wanting them to learn that lesson, but you can also show up and help them process that, you know, during that phase or that, that disciplinary time. That's beautiful. I, I mean, cause that's such a balance, you know, because I mean, we've talked a lot about Sayyidina Ali, but you know, something that comes to mind that he, he said is, you know, al khayru bayna sharrain, right? Yes. Like, yeah. you know, the true goodness lies in between true. extremes of with too much of something and too little. So aptly withholding and always in the mode of like the stick. Yes. But sometimes you need the carrot too, right? So it's like, totally. again, the balance between the two. So I, I think you very beautifully navigated those two things. I, I want you to come back because I, I don't want to. I know. We, we, we could, <laughs> a lot of tangents. You right? talked about three points that you had laid out in that yes. initial talk. Uh, Toxic culture. Not initial, but you, yeah. A talk you gave with Imam Tahir and how you kind of framed that conversation. One sure. was toxic culture. And what were the other the two? The other two is indoctrination and, is, and then powerless parenting. So these are the three areas yeah. that I feel like were really like seeing a lot in our community or just in general. So like I think we've world. touched on the first two for sure. sure. And even touched on the third. But I mean, maybe, you know, yeah. build no, a I, little bit more on that third point. About, absolutely. Yeah. So powerless parenting... Um, the way I defined it is there's actually six different qualities here, which we can get into. But the first are parents who are absent, and then parents who are unaware, parents who are passive, parents who are permissive, parents who are authoritarian, and parents who are afraid. And so yeah. how, how I break that down. So being absent, if you're absent, that just means you're really not present. You're physically not present. So if you're working 40, 60 plus hours and you're really not paying attention to your children, you are powerless. You will not have power in that relationship. If you're unaware, which means you're basically checked out. You know, there are a lot of people who, whether you want to call them blood diets or just off the grid or just not really interested in the culture around them because they're just not interested, they're checked out. They're unaware of all the dangers. They're unaware of the threat. So going back to the shepherd analogy, that is like the wolves are all around you and you're, you have no idea. The wolves being all around you. I mean, I think this is a crucial point because mm -hmm. Unlike, again, if we can, uh, in contradistinction to the way we grew up, mm -hmm. right, comparatively, our children, they never leave their peer groups. Exactly. And sometimes their peer groups may be f filled with sheep, 
But right. oftentimes they, they're, they're, they're not. Wolves. They're wolves. Oh, yeah. Because mm. so, like, you're specifically talking about like for sure. access on, over text to your friends nonstop. Oh, yeah. oh right? nonstop. No, yeah. no, no. And text is like almost old fashioned. My mm. kids, like it's like Snapchat and it's, yeah. and it's Instagram. Yeah. And, you know, we have tried, it, because the thing is there's always a way out. So you, you shut off internet access. Yeah. Then they start using the Wi-Fi. You know, again, yeah. there's all, like they are right. Luddites. They're not. They right. have got this all figured out. Yeah. And if you shut down one, they'll open another medium yeah. of being able to communicate. But the point being, they are in constant contact with their peer groups. We weren't like that. Number two, our peers had to go through gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. Like if, if the phone rang at 10 o'clock at night and my mom picked up the phone, as would often happen, or my father, my friend, if they were calling me at 10 p.m., would have to go through my mother totally. or father. So the, instantly, so you have uh, gatekeepers. An example of that is like male-female relations. If I, I remember my friend, my guy friend brought his girlfriend over one time and I got in trouble for that. Yeah, I forget so, even, but now, no, how do you stop a guy from texting a girl? Because they're I mean. all texting each other. And this is an important point to make. Imam al-Ghazali talks about the potent eye, the navara. This comes from the mother, that the mother's ability to penetrate the needs of a child early on in those development stages are unparalleled. So if we don't prioritize that, those especially in those first seven years, yeah. the importance of the mother being bonded to her child, I feel like it feeds into this what we're seeing now, wow, which is the attention cool. seeking. Yeah. The seeking mm. of a constant validation and attention is directly resulted from the, the loss of the mother's eye. Mm. Because w the benefit we all had is we had our mother's yeah. home. Right. Our mothers were home. My mother cooked three meals a day yeah. and she was always there, always. I mean, right? Me, Omar, I, right? I, I, I Everything know. was yeah, ready yeah, for you. Yeah. But that, it, it, it's, there's just this abundance of love and validation that comes through, even if it's not through words, even if it's not demonstratively shown to you, that fills the cup of the child in those early years. When that child is missing that navara, then they are susceptible to what? Looking for love in all the wrong places. Beautiful. Which is what, what And I want to also stress, you know, and, and you can agree, I would love, you know, sure. for you to add color to this. Because we were fortunate. I mean, right. you know, and our mothers didn't have to work. Right. Now, there are households, and Absolutely. certainly, I think, for a lot, of, a lot of us living in the Bay Area, right? I mean, you know, dual, dual income homes right. is sort of the norm here. It's not to say that a working mother or a mother who has a professional life outside right. of the, the, the home cannot be, cannot provide that nadara right. when she is home. Absolutely. I mean, I, if I can, my wife never listens, so this is not going to go anywhere. To, but the, to the show, to the, the show. <laughs> <laughs> not to you. But she, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm like preemptively making sure yeah, you're not going to get, you're not, uh, get, get in trouble. You. I just got that. He did yeah. save me. Exactly. Although, like uh, what I was saying is she doesn't listen to the show. So, yeah, thank you. Point well taken. Uh, that's a great one. Um, is that, you know, she, she has always worked. Uh, because mm -hmm. it was just the nature of what we've had to do. Um, I mean, she worked full time when sure. I, and she put me through graduate school and law school. So, you know what I mean? So it's like, anyway, point is, but in terms of attentiveness to the children, right. I mean, it mind boggling because it's not always about the number of hours, right? but it's about, again, right? The quality, quality of what quality. she's yeah. able to do in the few hours that she does overlap with the kids Absolutely. is remarkable. No, I'm so glad you brought it up because I don't want anybody to Thank misunderstand. Yeah. The the power of that uh, insight from Imam al Ghazali yeah. just reminds us of really um, the power of an adult safe caretaker, the ideal being the mother, but obviously grandmother will be there. And even in the time of the Prophet I said, I mean, we know that he was raised by Hanima, Hanima Saadiyya. Yeah. So it's not to say that it's only something that w the mother can do and nobody else, but who you entrust your children to, they have to be able to do that for you. They have to be able to pour into that child the, um, that, that, uh, like, I'm observing you, I'm watching you, I'm watchful over you, I'm with you. So if you have, for example, a babysitter, but that babysitter's checked out checking their phone and they're with a toddler, and the toddler is like, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm in my world, and nobody's interested because yeah. it's like, yeah, okay, okay, play, and I'm going to watch my Netflix series, that's not good enough. You have to have someone who... Again, ideally being a mother, father, the parents, but if that's not the, I mean, if that's not possible, then someone who's a loving, attentive, 
adult, safe adult, who will be present with that child. I mean, how many people have been raised by their nannies, you know, yeah. and they will say their nannies are like their mothers. I'll, I'll take all of them. I think, I think right? parent, both parents, father, father, mother, and aunts, uncles, grandparents, right? I, I'm all super grateful to like my, my, you know, parents or siblings and for like family. being there for my kids. Well, the village right? is a very real thing. And the that's the thing is, is we're missing thing. the village. Yeah. So we don't even have, we don't have a village. And then we also don't have the shepherds there to protect the flock. Yeah. So what's happening is Great we're point. having just these transient, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, what do you want to call them, but they're not really fixtures yeah, that are absolutely. stable that, that the child can look to and feel safe with. Right. And that, yeah. I think, leads to what we're seeing in this cult. I mean, this is the latchkey c culture, right? Like right. this is uh, the ge generation, a lot of um Well, we kids, were the latchkey kids. Yeah, we were, so sorry, we were the latchkey. Right. And then there was, there's another yeah. term yeah. I forgot, but we don't have a lot of parental... You know, and, or, or adults. Yeah. And adults. speaking of relationships, I also think that okay, you have your the love from your from the from the elders. Right. I also think that to your point about they're around their friends all the time. I think who their friends are oh, yeah. is is absolutely critical as well. And that also ties not only into like role modeling, like behavioral, it also ties into Islamic identity. Like if right. you if you're a fifteen year old and all your friends are proud of being Muslim, right? you're going to be proud to be a Muslim. But 100%. if you're, if you have just like a, you know, if you don't have that. Right. So it tie, I think it ties into yeah. behavior modeling right. and also identity. Mm. Well, Dr. Sachs, you know, Leonard Sachs, he talks a lot about this, and, about, you know, the peer influence, you know, mm -hmm. over, over teens, right? Because prior to adolescence, parents have a lot of influence over their children. But then as soon as they hit that point or that, um, you know, stage, the peer group starts to have a lot of influence and shape their own self image. So yes, the, who they're being influenced by, whether it's their peers, like uh, from school or, you know, their same age group, friends, or influencers that they somehow, you know, relate to, it is going to um, undermine, unless, you know, again, uh, parents can intervene somehow, which is what Dr. Sachs definitely recommends, you know, that you have to intervene at a certain point and limit the influence of the peer group Got they it. can never supersede the parents mm -hmm. uh, i want you to finish because i think sure. the, the uh was it the, the list the, 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 six the power star. list yeah, yeah the power sure so i um you know i had mentioned uh power parents who are absent unaware passive and this i, I kind of addressed before where yeah. you're just kind of doing whatever was done to you you're not really being active in your parenting the last three are permissive authoritarian and afraid. And these are really important because permissiveness is also a very serious problem. Yes. When you're just <clears throat> letting everything go because you're too afraid of not being their friend. And this is, I think, a really dangerous really you know, is. issue because we are first and foremost, their shepherds. Yes. And, and we have to assume that role first. That means we can be friendly and we should be friendly, but we cannot you know, forego shepherding just to be their friends, which is what's happening because, you know, parents want to be relevant and hip and cool. So it's like, sure, I'll do this and I'll let you go to this concert yeah. and I'll let you go here and I'll let you travel with your friends to, um, you know, for spring break. What? You know, like you need to not worry so much about, you know, them liking you as much as their safety and it's a very dangerous world. And no, then, think, before mm -hmm. you move on, sure. because I think you're nailing so many of the issues that, that, we, that we did want to bring up. I mean, I think yeah. it, when we we're talking about this, the idea of, parents being too permissive, Yes. what would you say then are the sort of negotiables versus non-negotiables, Okay. right? Where, like, where do you start? I mean, there's a lot, sure. you know, and we can go real basic if you like looking on the level of whether we talk about prayer, like sure. what, like whatever. So like, to me, it's look at the list of negotiables and what are non-negotiables. Sure. Well, I think the word you use is perfect because I actually really think that that is the right way of approaching these topics when oh. you have young children, teens, youth, yeah. we first and foremost have to remember in Islam, they're adults, right? When they become baligh, they're adults. Yeah. They have discernment, they're accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we don't approach discussions with the mindset of negotiation, and it just becomes this top down mm. model, which is what authoritarianism is, you, right? That's, that's right? That's the next thing. Then we, we really are laying out a, a very destructive path. So I feel like negotiation has to be the language. And that's where you teach your children to negotiate. They And I, I'm, I mean, I teach, uh, you know, now logic and critical thinking, but youth need to know how to defend their positions with logic. And I if like you're that. not teaching them that, that's maybe the starting point. 
you have an idea, you want something, and I'll give you a good example. I actually, you know, I, I did some counseling for fam for a family uh, a couple of years back, and they had this issue where their kids really loved the K-pop music. And the daughter, uh, one of the daughters, she's the eldest, she's a good responsible daughter, Mahajib and everything, but she's obsessed with these K-pop artists. So the parents were like, what do we do? Because she wants to go to these concerts here in San Francisco. And they're typical, you know, like, we don't want to, you know, let her out of just within a five mile radius, let alone go all the way to the city at night by herself with her friends. So they were really panicking. And so I had, you know, I had a group meeting with them. And I said, well, this is where you have to realize she's an adult. She she should be given some leeway to make decisions, um, but as long as she can be responsible and meet your major concerns, then you have to loosen the tether. So I said, what are your major concerns for safety? Okay, how can we al allay those concerns? A, you know, mapping, for example, on your phone, right? We can now map each other, right? Mm -hmm. Would that help you to know what she, where, you know, that where she is at all times? Absolutely. What's another way, um, you know, who she's with? Okay, so how about, and I, I mean, I was with the family, so I said, okay, how about you have to be reporting to your parents like every hour with pictures of exactly where you are. No, I, I, I laid yeah, down a full yeah. plan. And I said, this is how... Beautiful. You negotiate because you have legitimate concerns <clears throat> as parents, and she understood it when it was mediated this way, right? But, but prior to our meeting, it was just like, no, no, no. So I was like, listen, she's an adult. She's gonna, do you want her to find a way to do it behind your back and betray you? And then, God forbid, the consequences of that, we don't know. Or do you want her to have open communication, fully right. trusting you? So let's lay it out and put these parameters here. So, anyway, once we were able to put all of the concerns on both sides out, they came to a very amicable, agreeable, okay, we're going to do this. Alhamdulillah, she went, she had a fun time, she came back, everything was fine. Lovely. But So I think this is what we need to do is, uh, and I, that's why I, I mentioned Imam al-Ghazali's uh, framework, because I think if we don't inculcate an identity of a rational, critical, thinking individual in our children, then we're just going to be battling emotions and appetites for the rest of our time with them. Yeah. Inculcate the intellect, get them to think critically, and have sound arguments if you are against something. Don't just come with emotions and top-down authoritarianism, which is never works. It never works because they'll just rebel against you. And that's why that type of parenting is confused <clears throat> because authoritative parenting is Islamic prophetic parenting. That's when you're stepping into your role as that shepherd. You're the rule lawgiver. You, you make those rules. I mean, we're not the lawgiver. Allah's the lawgiver. But you know what I mean. I know, we, yeah. we we enact the law. We we teach the law. We model the law, but we don't force the law. Right. Like you said, I mean, you, again, you're very um, particular in the terms you use. There's authoritative, and then there's authoritarian. Exactly. And people are conflating the two. They're conflating the because two because they think yeah. like tiger mom, tiger dad, being really <laughs> yeah. tough. Like you said, hovering helicopter, yeah. and I just do it because I said so. Yeah. And there's no negotiation. Mm -hmm. Shutting the conversation down is how I'm going to maintain my authority, but you're actually undermining yourself and your children will lose respect for you. And that's yeah. why I call it powerless parenting. And then the last one is when you are afraid. Fear is uh, a huge problem in today's world with the, in the world of parenting, because when we're in constant states of panic and fear, we give in. And we're not using our rational, critical so, thinking skills. That's the one I'm a little hazy on. So sure. w w d define fear and yeah, sure. define I fear say, as yeah, parents. I, I'm glad you brought that because yeah. I, I want to qu qualify what yeah. I mean. It's, it's fear not rooted in like tawakkel, where it's not, it's an anxiety. Like, because we, we don't, first of all, like I always tell parents and myself too, we have to put our best effort forward, but outcomes belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you have real strong tawakkal and you believe like Prophet Nuh alayhi salam and many of the great people of our history, they put all of their best efforts, but guess what? They didn't get the results that they wanted. And that's okay because at the end of the day, Allah, it's all from Allah, right? But if you don't have that world view and you think your everything is in your control, then you're susceptible to panic and that panic and anxiety starts to fuel your decisions and you're not really entrusting the affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm -hmm. and using sound judgment, letting go when you need to. These are the types of things that come with more, you know, resolution from from your faith. What comes to mind is how kids show you your flaws, right? Because right. you can get impatient. Mm -hmm. I think what I've learned recently, they actually show you show you your 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 faith because Absolutely. to to your point, 
you know, you, if you believe that Allah is true and, and it's good, Islam is good and the mm-hmm. best, then you show it to them. Exactly. And then you trust, you make dua and you trust that they will gravitate towards the good and the truth, right? But that's, that's almost like a, a reflection on your own, your Absolutely. own heart. Absolutely. That's faith. why Allah says He will test you with your children yeah. and your wealth and all of these things because you will be tested in your faith through them. So yeah. 100%. And that's why we have to see them as immense gifts. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a really powerful framework, the way you describe the sort of various like parenting styles and the areas of focus that we should have as parents. But I think that sometimes that fear, if you will, comes from a very real place because, you know, as I sort of alluded to or maybe even mentioned explicitly in, in the introduction, you know, there are elements of our culture that are truly toxic on a level that we have never seen before unprecedented even in America's history. So like, what is your message to parents who are genuinely afraid? Uh, And that fear may be sort of, it's paralyzing, but that fear Mm -hmm. of our children and as consumers of this very, very toxic culture. Sure. No, Jazakallah, it's a very valid question. And I agree with you because this is what I hear from parents all the time. Like you said, they're paralyzed with fear about what do we do? How can we protect our children? Especially when it comes to just the social trends that we're seeing, the cultural trends, those things are really scary to parents. Like, am I going to have to deal with this? That my child may suddenly have a new identity and want to change themselves or will they lose their faith? So all of these things are very real. And I think, you know, I had mentioned before that Dr. Leonard Sachs, he, um, he's very, you know, vocal about how toxic American culture is. And I think, you know, sometimes when we hear it from within our own community, we're like, okay, yeah, we all kind of, it's like an echo chamber. But when you have clinical psychologist, MD, who has thousands of patients, American born and raised, literally telling you that American culture is toxic, somehow that resonates, you know, and he has a really great quote from, um, I think it's the collapse of parenting, where he says, American his children are immersed in a culture of disrespect for parents, teachers, and one another. They learn it from television, even on the Disney Channel, where parents are portrayed as clueless, out of touch, or absent. They learn it from celebrities on the internet. They learn it from social media. They teach it to one another. They wear t-shirts emblazoned with slogans like, I'm not shy, I just don't like you. And he goes on and on. But what he's basically telling us is that it's permeated every aspect of our society, this toxic culture. And I think for my message to parents is to really, information is power. And first of all, we're Muslim, right? We don't fall into despair. It's haram to fall into despair. We have to have that trust that if we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're holding on tight to the rope of Allah, we're going to be fine. So that should be the first tawakul, as tawakul, you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Tawakul, full trust that Allah yeah. subhanahu wa ta'ala has, well, you'll be fine as long as you're holding on to Him. So that's first. But then you also have to understand why all of this toxicity has come into the culture. And to okay. me, that requires knowledge. And in order to really understand the rapid changes, I think you have to look into um, you know, what is influencing this culture, what has been influencing all of these changes uh, for decades now. And that lands you right at postmodernity. Because if you don't know what postmodernity is, postmodernism and the effects of it, and its move away from religion and tradition, moving toward a new vision for humanity, literally removed from religion, because they see religions as being oppressive, hierarchical systems, power, you know, structures that that human beings have invented, because there's no objective truth, right? So if you completely under, I mean, you're, you're undermining all religion and all values that come from a religion when you espouse the notion that there is no objective truth, that, that morality is, is, uh, you know, subjective, Relative. that all of these ideas are coming from a worldview that is rooted in atheism, nihilism. And if you're not informed about that and how they have managed to, as I said, you know, really permeate every aspect of our culture from academia, they've hijacked completely. And everybody who knows academia knows that you cannot escape postmodernity. It's everywhere now, right? It's a whole new way of looking at everything. They're literally redefining history. They're re-envisioning everything. They're mapping out an entire new world that parts ways with religious tradition. And that means that everything that comes out of religious tradition, like institutions like marriage, the the church or the mosque or the synagogue also become 
uh, irrelevant. Uh, you know, they're archaic, uh, you know, from the pa relics of the past, leave them in the past. This is a very dangerous idea, but this is the kind of stuff, the indoctrination that I was talking about, that our children are being fed, spoon fed through these mediums in schools now with teachers who are very open about their political views, mm -hmm. their ideologies, uh, ideological views. It's very, I mean, I, I remember being in school, I didn't know anything personal about my professors or my teachers, right? Because there were boundaries about what there was a professional boundary right. you they didn't cross it now i've had muslim students college and high school tell me that their teachers and professors so in a high school and college level literally tell them that there is no god because they are atheists very proud of their atheism and they question you know they, they start get into these debates with them about the existence of god so what would happen to a young teenager who is told by their parents to trust these authority figures in a, in this school setting, and now that very authority figure is planting very very toxic seeds of in doubt their, of mm -hmm. doubt mm -hmm. in their mind about everything, their entire worldview and everything that they've been taught by their family. It causes all this confusion, which is what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So I feel like parents need to know that, and without that knowledge, then it's very scary because you don't know the direction. But when you see that there is there has been, and there is an agenda. And they have goals and objectives that they want to reach, then you can at least feel some. Uh, I think um, right. you, it's not as as overwhelming because you can see the roadmap ahead. And you know, uh, you know again, just to sort of build on that, I sure. think I think sometimes parents respond to what you're describing, right? What they see their kids or hear about their kids facing in in whether it's academia or in the educational system as a whole at any level is to present Islam using the same sort of postmodern lens. Mm. And by that I mean you combat empiricism and absolute empiricism mm. and absolute scientism and it's you know and the rational being the sort of the mm -hmm. uh, overarching way to view the world bereft of faith bereft of faith, bereft of metaphysical mm -hmm. realities, right? Because right? mm -hmm. again, metaphysical realities. And so I think that parents sort of, we may try to combat that kind of empiricism by talking about, well, look how rational Islam is right. and so on. Science and things, Science in the Quran and, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. But it's even beyond that. It's just, the, again, the, the sort of language we use when Absolutely. we talk about our faith. And so I think, I think it's important to realize that the way to counter that is not necessarily to adopt those sort of postmodern tropes. Absolutely. Rather, be very open and, and, and don't be shy to talk about the miraculous nature of Absolutely. wahi and revelation of things that are, like I said, the metaphysical realities. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and so rather than shying away from like the hadith that says, you know, that, that the sun sets in the horn of the, you know, like right. whatever it is, right? I mean, we tend to sort of throw things out because right. we're like, well, that doesn't compute with either the rational mind or the modern mind. Absolutely. Okay. I would love for you to sort of speak to that no, as well. What you said is mm -hmm. so on point because it yeah. actually reeks of insecurity. You know, when you're mm. not, if you're truly, you know, as Omar said too, like you really believe, right? You have real strong faith. You have to show that. It's It sounds very uh, contrived if you're trying to use their, their very same right. tactics. It just doesn't sound authentic. So just show your faith, believe, get up and pray. You know, if you really have, for example, a concern about something, show that you're leaning on that faith that you so much believe and you have ardent, you know, yeah. true conviction in. But like you said, sometimes, you know, I think even our Christian brothers and sisters have realized, as I've read some articles from... Yeah. from they're know, realizing it. Yeah, they're Absolutely. realizing it too, that they, they were going in the wrong direction because it's right. like you're trying to compete with this, you are. like you said, this new age scientism, this new kind of mode that we're in, uh, this new era we're in where everything is competing with being, you know, provable, that um, you end up giving up the most defining and beautiful qualities of, of what real faith are, which lie heavily in the metaphysics right. and the unseen that's and the right. unknown. That's right. Right? So I think we need to go back to that. But that's where we're, you know, re really understanding spirituality, 
and and connecting with uh, tradition in the way that we're taught, you know, with ritual practice, mm-hmm. with the recitation of the Quran, all of these traditions, practices, I should say, that we have to maintain consistently, I think right. would speak volumes as opposed to just constantly trying to argue every point, you mm-hmm. know, actions, mm-hmm. as I say, speak louder than words. So, and I, I remember reading um, an article, I can't, um, I wish I had the exact source, but it was it, talking specifically about this, that, you know, in the Christian tradition, some young girls are were now turning to to wanting to you know devote their lives to Christ and I think they were even thinking to go into the you know become nuns but they were saying that part of their journey was realizing that all the cool like efforts of the pastors that they were exposed to you know just try to be that relevant rock and roll yeah, kind yeah. of character was not working. It was actually right. pushing them in the opposite direction. Yeah. It was only until they met people with true faith who were just very their conviction just spoke through their actions, that that's when they felt the effects of faith. That's right. But it wasn't by that charming kind of, you know, let me try to be, you know, um, hip you know, and, hip and cool. Like a, Speak to you in your win, vernacular. That sounds yeah. like a, you know, win, win the battle, lose the war type, type mm. thing, right? Yeah. You might get a short term, like, oh, okay, but then in the long run, you're kind of doing damage. Yeah. Because, and we should, like you said, I mean, it, it reeks of insecurity. Mm-hmm. Like, we shouldn't be ashamed to talk about or to inculcate in our cho- children uh, a sense of awe about exactly. things. I mean, I remember, I mean, I came from a relatively, you know, traditional Muslim family background as well. I was raised in a family where, you know, again, very sort of typical of the immigrant mm-hmm. Muslim experience, I think, for most. But I was taught, for example, a, a you know, a sense of reverence and ta'adim of the Quran, yes. for example. And so, you know, because we've sort of, uh, well, the Quran, you know, shouldn't occupy the highest books, you know, the, the, the highest top shelf of the, of the biggest bookshelf you have. We've gone from that, the pendulum has swung to be like, okay, well, it's just a book and, you know, reference yeah, it and so look cool. at it, right? It's like, so it, it's okay to teach your children a sense of awe and reverence to Allah and his Rasul and his Kitab and Absolutely. so on, right? And again, that I think, again, reeks of that kind of level of insecurity because again, we want to sort of comport our way of speaking of faith in a way that is, which is rational and Mm -hmm. and conforms to rules of empiricism and so on. Absolutely. And we're missing the target again because we're doing that, right? We're we're making the same mistakes, Mm. but if we actually put our trust in Allah, His words are timeless. The Prophet's words are timeless. They will, and He promised, this is a perfected religion. I just did a talk with an interfaith group last week on this uh, question that they posed, which is, how does your faith adapt to new changes? And I just started off, well, our faith defines itself as perfect. It doesn't need to adapt to, in in the sense that we don't um, reform the faith. We certainly deal with emerging nuanced issues, but Mm -hmm. we don't feel the need to change the faith, which is what, you know, with the Protestant Reformation and everything with Christianity, you saw this complete reform of the faith. And that's why I think, you know, I mean, the pastor was very uh, well spoken, but he talked about how those ideas led to countless number of denominations. And so when you, it's about, you know, it's a slippery slope. But I think the point being is that, you know, Alhamdulillah, our faith has all the answers. And if we had yaqeen, the Prophet, you know, he in a hadith said, uh, which is, I fear, but for my ummah, the weakness of conviction. Mm. And I think that's where we're at right now, which is, you know, the other hadith toward the latter times, uh, holding on to one's faith would be like holding on to hot coal. There's a lot of hadith yeah, that indicate that right. we, we are not, you know, our faith is, is, is being tested, it's hard, but also the strength of our faith is, you know, we need to contend with that how right. truly do we believe because if we have real strong faith we're going to have to show up and show it and that comes mm-hmm. in the preservation of of these you know beautiful um parts of our faith you right. know adab uh, like you said ta'zim um showing uh, reverence to um our scholars our sp- places of worship these things are really important for children to uh, to get and what's interesting is i mean it's kind of ironic but research proves that if you want to protect your children from a lot of like those risk factors that all parents are worried about 
One of the ways to do that is actually to have them preserve a really strong relationship with with the house of worship. Mm. Like it's actually listed in okay. one of the ways to protect your children. So right. you know, it's it's something that we even science proves that if you if you want to protect them, then don't sever their relationship with their religious community and identity, and actually preserve those traditions right. because those will affect their self image, their self value, and in a world where um, you know, there's just a lot of, I mean, you know, this is the age of, of technology and you have, you know, CGI and com- a- chat GPT and AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's just so much make believe mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. the real, who who's the only, the only real is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think can really impact our children, but we have to show them. I, I think maybe now's a good time to talk about yeah. the, the the idea of schools. Uh, I, I, who was it, Pervez? Were you telling me that Sheikh Hamza had a recent um, talk? said if he, you know, the school, they've had success with Zaytuna College, mm-hmm. Nashas, and Ashas, they've done great with that. But I think he said if he could do it all over again, and maybe Aunt, my sister was telling me, yeah. if he could do it all over again, he would focus on K through 12. Absolutely. Um, because that's where, again, going back to the Hadith, that's where the Muslim behaviors and identities being formed. Post-14, they're adults, right? Right. So what are your thoughts? on? I, I, I know there's... There's homeschooling, there's Islamic schools, there's public schools, sure. each come probably with a different set of challenges, but also benefits as well. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts on, on those options? Yeah, no, alhamdulillah. I've heard him say that several times now, and I, he, he truly believes it because he's seeing that, uh, you know, the formative years, those early years are really the most important. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, once they reach a certain point, it becomes much harder because their identities are kind of solidified by the time they're in, you know, that adolescent age. Uh, And interestingly, I mean, this is just a a footnote, but I remember reading a long time ago that 12 years, I think, was the age where most religious conversion experiences happen. So, we sometimes don't realize like 12 even is a a really uh, pivotal and, and poignant time in a child's life where they start to suddenly make sense of things. Uh, So everything we're doing after that, it's kind of like we're working upstream, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas earlier, Mm -hmm. we have more times. Like he says, like he he usually, I've heard him say, up until fourth grade, like you have your children, like they <laughs> yeah. really listen to everything you say. They're hanging on a, th- you know, everything you say. They, you have so much influence over them. But after that age, they start to look to other things, right? So, I feel like he's made those realizations, you know, in his experience. And I would say, just as an educator working within the community, I'm, I'm a homeschooling mom, but I've worked in Islamic schools for a long time. I currently work in Islamic schools, and I also have a lot of relatives who are public school children. Right. I've seen the full spectrum, and I've seen, mashallah, great and we success all, stories. We, we all, yeah, we, yeah, we're exactly. Of I'm a product, school. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, my siblings, all of us, mm-hmm. you know, we all went to public schools. So I've seen the full spectrum. Of of, yeah. of outcomes, right. and I don't think there's any necessarily one, you know, size fits all perfect model. I mean, ideally, obviously, it would be wonderful if we could have, um, you know, really beautiful institutions that, sure. you know, I, that would be ideal. But yeah. a lot of our our home, I mean, our Islamic schools are also struggling just yeah. to stay afloat because of the challenges. So, absolutely. And to your earlier point, it doesn't replace the role of. The right, caregivers, absolutely. the parents, and, the and, extended absolutely. family. And we shouldn't beguile ourselves into thinking that the types of issues or conversations that are happening in public school, your kids aren't having that oh, in an Islamic school. Oh, they're having a lot. Thank you. Uh, exactly. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, no, no. I, yeah. I have many we, friends who are um, teachers in Islamic mm-hmm. schools all across the country. The the stories oh. I hear on a regular... Yeah. So, yeah, this, there's this notion that, you know, that we're somehow impervious to these problems. That's just a lie. So, they're within our community. They're happening at, at all levels. But I think the most important thing in terms of the schooling, you know, dilemma is curriculum. And I would say that's where Sheikh Hamza's focus is on now. Like, what are the children being taught? Because you could have, you know, and I know there's students who've gone through the full Islamic school experience, but they didn't have the, the best out, you know, outcome because the, sc- the curriculum or the teachers maybe they were exposed to actually did more harm in some cases. And so I think looking at curriculum, looking at, you know, trained, well-trained teachers, would be the best way to move forward, you know, in terms of mm-hmm. what our, you know, community can hopefully aspire to and that we start investing and in pouring more resources. Because we have a lot of masajid, but how many of our masajid end up being lights off most of the week, right? They're not really used spaces because unless Ramadan, you know, then yeah, everybody sure, shows up. Sure. But most of the time, they're, they're beautiful buildings that are 
you know, relatively speaking, not very, um, you know, frequented. Yeah. Whereas our schools, if we were to mm -hmm. shift gears a little bit and again, have a better target, we, if we were putting more of our resources into building institutions that are long term and right. really create a safe haven for mm -hmm. our children, mm -hmm. because I think we do need safe havens from this insanity outside, we need safe havens. And those children would inshallah grow up and then the mosques would follow rather than back trying to get it backwards. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, they would all, yeah, all be part exactly. of the virtuous same. cycle. Uh, yeah. I, I sort of like to, to me, Omar's question also raises this idea that I've wrestled with, which is keeping things in house as parents versus outsourcing, right. if you want to borrow that parlance. Sure. And so, what do you think is the healthy balance? Because we know that, I mean, because I think you can find examples, sure. like we talked about, you know, Halima, you know, and we talked about uh, caretakers, and that's certainly been a part of our tradition. Sure. So, we don't shy away from the fact that right. parents have to be the end all be all. Right. Because this we find your family, Thank which you. is not. There you go. Yeah. But what is the healthy balance then between keeping things in house versus, you know, having to outsource certain sure. things? Well, I think, again, our tradition has the answers, you know, alhamdulillah, many, many of our scholars, you know, point to the the home, the mother in particular, her role being the first madrasa or the first teacher of virtue is really important. So mm. virtue, because, you know, teaching, there's multiple things that you, you teach your children, right? Mm. And by the way, it's one of the rights of children over their parents. So they have sound education. So sound education is just learning good things, learning virtue, virtuous behavior, ethics, all of these, you know, dean, um, good sciences, knowledge that's, you know, uh, useful and beneficial, all of that would fall into uh, the right of a child for good education. But I think if the parents really prioritize that, uh, then they would also have to look to themselves and know their own limitations, right? Okay. So if you did not learn, you know, your dean properly, maybe that's the starting point, which is so that you become a conduit, right? The proper you know, means by which your child can actually learn Dean, because they idolize you, especially in those first years that nobody else, I mean, yes, maybe you'll have other loved ones that are in the picture, but inshallah, if you're that loving, caring, compassionate, beautiful parent that you should be to your young children, they will do anything in the world to please you. And so you have so much power and I think that's where that initial responsibility would fall on the parents to really know their dean well, model it well. But then outside of that, um, absolutely. I mean, I mentioned like in my family, my grandfather played a very big role in teaching us dean. Yeah. So if you have um, a permanent fixture, you know, someone like a grandparent or an auntie who is who loves to teach, and the teacher at being an educator, I will tell you, not everybody's cut out to teach. And this is where temperament theory is very useful yeah. because um, when you understand temperament theory, then you, first you know your own temperament, but you also know what you match well with. Right. Um, I have, for example, a friend who is a sanguine, which is she is very bubbly. Her daughter is very methodical, organized child, structured, very structured child. She just wants like someone to get things done. So her, she perceives her mom's sort of buoyance, that you know, energy, that energy yeah. to be like, you know, all over the place. She right. just wants like a really, you know, a person mm. to come and teach her and just be like, this is your lesson plan. And she, so, so I'm like, okay, that's really good for you to know this about mm. your daughter because you're not helping her. If she doesn't gel with your style, then you need to outsource because you could actually... Um, make her, you know, yeah. journey d harder just by forcing your your style upon yeah. her. And so you I might be able to outsource that to kind of a balance between in house and and either to like your your like like your spouse, absolutely, or a family member, yes, or like you said, you know, a grandparent or perhaps an elder yeah, in, the, community in, the, member. in the community, right? Yeah, I know. I always tell parents it's so important when you have young children that you find other parents who have same eight children because mm. there's going to be a handoff that happens at some point where you're going to need them to be mentoring your children. Mm -hmm. You're going to, cause I I'll tell you, I've had to do this role for many of my friends and they're like scratching their heads all the time because they're like, but I've been telling them this for years. Why don't they listen to me? I'm like, exactly. Because your mom and dad and what, and this is actually a really important point that I think people who don't know may, may benefit from adolescents are wired to, in order to forge their own identity to go against their parents. It's not personal. They need, it's, it's, they're trying to create an identity separate from you. Right. So if you tell them to go right, their brain is like, no, go left. <laughs> that's not personal, yeah. right? Yeah, it's just no, part of their, great reminder. In, in order for them to actualize their own separate identity from you, they feel like they have to not follow you. Get it? Whereas I have literally verbatim sometimes said 
the same thing <laughs> that the parents have told them. And they're like, thank you so much. And they're like suddenly transformed. Yeah. And their parents are like, I don't know what to do. I'm yeah. like, you're not doing anything. It's just you yeah. are not the one to send right. the message. So hand off. Like one of my chopped liver. You yeah, know, it's exactly. Like, well, yeah. That, well, that's that what it, feel, it feels like a betrayal. <laughs> right. Like I poured so much into this exactly. child. They don't respect my opinion, right. but they'll take it from a stranger. I'm like, right. no. Yeah. It's just that they that's feel right. that they'll just follow. If they're following you, then they're not independent. Great point. And I think for someone like me, at least, especially who, who, who tends to shy away or look down upon outsourcing, I think that's a great point because yeah. they're almost wired. Or no, not almost. They are literally wired. To discount everything you're gonna, yeah, you're, you're gonna say at a certain the, age. Yeah. At a certain age, I mean, I, I'm assuming. Yeah. I hope. Yeah, yeah. No, it <laughs> that, that, that it comes around. It does. It does. I know it did with me and my parents, so yeah. I can only you know. No, be, it does. And yeah. you know, just as we as we do yeah. get close, um, to wrapping. We, yeah, we we've talked about kind of a lot of the things to look out for, which are yeah. scary for parents. We've yeah. you've talked also about things for parents to consider and approaches for parents to take, and then you talked about like just trusting, so doing our part, and then right. trusting and a lot, right? Like, do yes. your part, trust tie your a lot. camels, and yeah, then trust in a lot. Yes. I think uh, I wanted to share, and, and I'd love to hear your, your comment as well. I was talking to my mom about my own kids and whatnot, and she, she said, don't forget dua. Absolutely. Because, like, our ancestors made dua for their, yes. their progeny, so keep doing that. Yes. And, and then that ties also into doing your part and trusting Allah. So I don't know if you want to just touch on that as no, well. No, exactly. Like it's a perfect point. And I definitely, uh, it's, it's something that needs to be mentioned always when we talk to parents about parenting, because it's very hard. If you feel powerless, you don't know what yeah. to do. Well, that is an action, right? Dua is a weapon the of the believer. paralyzing fear that yeah, parents may have. Totally. And and what's the best way, you know, to, to overcome fear is to feel powerful. So right. when you're being told that Dua is the weapon of the believer, it's empowering, right? So absolutely we have to rely on dua and i've i've i mean i've spoken with parents where they come in tears i've had people with you know my my son just came out and said he doesn't believe in islam anymore what do i do and they're just at wit's end but my question always is what's sabrun jamil right mm. sabrun jamil is defined as at the strike of a calamity that you put your faith in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you go to you know as they say they as they say, take it to the mat, you know, you fall on your knees and you yeah. go and you beseech your Lord because you know that the only one who can change that circumstances for it, for you or for your child or whoever is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So prayer is incredibly important. So I'll, I'll ask them like, you you know, did you have, you, how, what, what's your prayer schedule? What, how much prayers are you doing? Did you make, <laughs> you know, are you getting up for tahajjud? Some of, in some cases, they're not praying because shaitan is, you know, paralyzing them or bringing them to such a state of despair that right. they've turned the opposite direction, which is exactly what he does. He right. he uses, right, the Quran says he'll use fear of poverty and fear to get you to an immobilized state. So that's what, where they've fallen, and that's where we have to remind one another, no, 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 get up, wake up, set your alarm, wake up, keep beseeching. And I I mean, I recently went to um, Mass Ikna in Chicago, you know, this past December, uh -huh. and I was with Dr. Rania, and we were standing, and mashallah, we met with this mother and daughter, and I won't forget it, it was such a beautiful uh, exchange, but the daughter, she said that she gave her mom a really hard time, and she actually left Islam, I think for, I don't know, it was like more than, maybe maybe close to 10 years. And she, um, and the mother, mashallah, she didn't stop making dua. She, and she said, she said, the daughter said, it's because of her dua and love. Like she didn't close the door on me. She didn't shut me out. But her mom was like, I just made dua. Mm -hmm. Just whatever, every day, every day, just to Allah guide her. But it was so beautiful to see the daughter witnessing that it was my mother's duas that brought me back, both of them full-blown hijab, stronger than ever. But she said, I gave her a really hard time. I left the faith. I was out. And I think aside from the fact that duas do get answered and are true, I think the kids witnessing just that calm and sure. confidence in the, instead of like, yeah. oh my God, you're going to, you're going to, you know, you got to change and all that. Just like, it's all right. Yeah. Exactly. I got, I'm making the art for you. You're good. Exactly. No, it's true. It's kind of right? like a mind, you know, your Jedi yeah, mind yeah. <laughs> tricking it, them in well, a way. It was, you know? yeah. uh -uh. It, and in some ways, it goes back to, I think, uh, what we, we were give talking her about. The Star Wars. <laughs> as, as Star Wars says, uh, the, the Star Wars in it. Yeah. Unprompted. Unprompted, yeah. <laughs> it's the Star Wars reference. Oh. Um, no, but what I was saying was, in many ways, it goes back to what you were saying about all of the trappings or the, the misgivings that we find in postmodernism. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, dua is the ultimate rejection of all of that Absolutely. nonsense right because it's it's saying look i believe in an unseen lord and i and i and i worship him 
I am fighting the urge to respond to every rational argument with mm -hmm. other empirical knowledge and information exactly. by just praying to Allah Absolutely. And, and believing that that metaphysical reality and connection exists and that, you know, that's again where all of the true guidance comes from. So, well, he uh, says specifically, yeah. right, in the Hadith Qudsi, Ana andi dhani abdi right. bi. That is like the, that to me is like a formula for success. I am as my servant thinks of me. I am as Thank my servant thinks of me, yeah, right? Translation. So when you, you go to the prayer mat and you are worshiping and you're saying, you're the only one who can change them, bring them back, bring them back, and you're begging and you're begging, what you're doing is you're reaffirming your faith, you're proving your conviction, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you because he will prove you right. So it's like a fail-proof formula. And you just have to trust that, you know, inshallah, the dua is answered. And again, dua is answered according to his way. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we can't script these things. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes we think it has to come out the way that we want. But when we say dua is answered, what we say is, what we mean is it can be answered exactly as you're asking. It can be replaced with something better or it can be delayed. But in all three cases, you defer to him and right. you surrender and you say, you're in control. I'm not. Clearly, I'm not in control. Right? Or, or, or it preserves you from a, from a, from a calamity. Right. I mean, you know, right? Something, something uh, exactly. like you said, worse or uh, something that you couldn't even have possibly imagined. Exactly. Is being averted. Exactly. Uh, as a, uh, as your dua being mustajab. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think something. it was Ibn Abbas who said that, right. yes, like a calamity in this world is a blessing because it's not in your, it's not in the next world, which would be far sure. worse, right. right? And if it's not in, you know, your faith, um, you know, it's it's also a blessing because to have a faith crisis personally would be, uh, you know. So, so may, maybe we kind of, as we get closer, I think a dua for our, our kids, oh, like may wow. Allah guide them and I mean, uh, make things oh, that's easy tough. for them. I'm, I'm not very good at impromptu duas. <laughs> I've heard you, mashallah, you've given mm. actually far better duas, but I think generally, yeah. you know, um, I would just say all of us, I think we have to really remind ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control and that he told us, he warned us that we will be tested in different ways. For some of us, it might not be our children, it might be our health, it might be our wealth, it might be other things. But at the end of the day, if we lean on our faith and, and follow it as we're instructed to, inshallah, everything will be fine. And that kind of, I know it sounds much, you know, easier said than done, but if we... Um, you know, bring our hearts together and, you know, just really, as I said, remind ourselves that the dunya is a place of, of challenge and difficulty, then inshallah, you know, we're, we're stronger together. And I think that's the problem too. I mean, I have so many thoughts on this, but sorry, it's not really giving you your dua. But just, no, no, this, I feel like part of the reason why a lot of our, our strength of conviction has dissipated is also going back to post-modernity is one of their tactics is the privatization of faith, right? They've really forced that on us where it's like you're not really, you're discouraged from sharing your faith openly. So what's happened no. is that we don't really come together with these powerful moments of like strength for each other because everybody's kind of like, oh, inwardly, you know, I don't want to show off. I don't want to be ostentatious and all these fears which are legitimate. But if it's making you now question everything and you're feeling weak, it's not helping you. So I feel like part of the issue is that our, as our community, we haven't really come together to hold each other. Like a lot of parents are struggling. To me, it's the number one issue I get every single talk, no matter what. People are freaking out. We don't know what to do. But if only we could come together, not just in Ramadan on, you know, like for the PM, I mean the Tarawih or the final khatam duas. That's yeah. when everybody shows up and yeah. we're all feeling the power. But imagine if we had that right. kind of um, presence in our life, you know, yeah. where we're holding each other up. I think we'd be able to endure these tests more. And that's what we saw in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu They had, you know, strong yeah. unity, the bricks, right? The links that they were holding right. each other. So with that said, may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala protect all of us, our children, our families. May He fortify our hearts, inshallah. Uh, may we uh, really hold on to our prayer first and foremost and diligently without excuse fulfill our obligations with our prayer as well as the the quran i think these are the means with which we're going to be able to mm -hmm. really endure these tests and, and vicissitudes of life as they say <laughs> is through the what we've been given as uh, the healing as the means of power as the means of strength 
And in the absence of that, nothing will compare. We can try to, you know, as you said, look to other means to scramble to try to find solutions because we're so scared. But I think if we don't realize the power that we've been given, we're just... Um, we're going to continue. No, thank you so much. And um, Baba, there's a lot I could say <laughs> to conclude the show. But I mean, I first and foremost, just to want to thank you for your time. Oh, I mean, you've been extremely generous with your time. And you were talking about blessings earlier. And I, I, I was going to end on that note by mm -hmm. saying that I think, you know, we as a community are blessed to have people like you. Exactly. Um, because no, no. And, and I mean that sincerely, because it's not just about knowledge and inf in information, but it's about that the, the like like the prophet saying like when Allah wants good of someone you know you mm -hmm. like gives them clarity. understanding and clear yeah clarity with in in terms of their faith and their religion and I think I I love the way you bring together you know so much from our tradition but also from you know mental health uh, perspectives and truly uh, a blessing but um, I guess for those who are listening and may not live in the Bay Area and get to see you on a frequent basis where can people engage you find you you know, maybe even reach out to you. Uh, sure. First of all, Jazakallah khair to you, uh, Omar and Parvez, for uh, inviting me to the, to be a part of this. This was such an enjoyable um, conversation. I feel like I could really talk to you guys forever and maybe talk your ears off. <laughs> no, not at all. But thank uh, you, especially on these types of topics, yeah. I, they're very um, important. Uh, so thank you for the honor. Uh, Jazakallah khair. May Allah continue to give you both a success uh, in all that you do. Cause, yeah. uh, I'm sure you're reaching thousands and thousands of hearts, alhamdulillah. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I am on social media on three platforms currently, really, actually four, but uh, mainly Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, which uh, I'm not as active on on the last two, but Instagram I'm probably the most active on. I also am on Clubhouse, which is probably <laughs> the most uh, irrelevant of all of the <laughs> social media, unfortunately. It had its boom. It had its boom. It had but its it was boom very in COVID. It was. Yeah. Um, COVID, Sad. you know, <laughs> I know we were all on it, yeah, and right. Sheikh Hamza was on That's there. Right. It, it was fun, but I'm still there. We're showing our um, Bay Area colors at this point. <laughs> we're like talking about Clubhouse. I know. <laughs> we're so spoiled, but yeah. I, I'm still on on there and I'm, I feel like I'm one of the last few that are there but I, I do do uh, weekly classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays so I teach okay. the six points of tabligh currently I was doing purification of the heart but Sheikh Hamza suggested to do the six points of tabligh and then I'm also doing content of character okay. on Thursdays so um, oh and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention we're here recording at the Muslim Community Center in uh, Pleasanton yes. so people can go to mccespay.org I believe yes. and they can you know there's archives of all of the programs that have been held at the masjid yes and they can find plenty of your content yes i have to teach here yeah, so right. monthly for women but i also do different programs so yeah and they archive all of that and all yes. of that is made available yeah their playlists so. yeah there if you, you do search, and we didn't yeah. talk too much about it. we're like almost like saving it for another episode but some of the work regarding mental health mm -hmm. that you do i know you have uh, we talked a little about the website yes do you want to talk about that event sure so i uh, founded uh, with dr nafisa Sikandri, my first cousin um mental health the number four muslims.com and we started that off as an initiative to really address a lot of the mental health issues in the community mm -hmm. providing both a clinical and an islamic perspective and alhamdulillah that has kind of veered into her she has a name by the same uh, practice by the same name okay. so she's kind of taken over that project but alhamdulillah currently i'm working with uh, dr rania awad uh, on a couple of different issues future er, guest project. of the show inshallah. inshallah yeah she's brilliant yes. with with maristan uh, yeah. and alhamdulillah i've been yeah. Really honored to have worked with her for a while now. Since I've returned to the Bay in 2016, Excellent. we were part of the Muslim Community um, Advisory Board uh, through her Stanford program. So there's a lot there, but uh, in other uh, ways, I'm you know uh, mostly uh, doing a lot of spiritual driven content that in a way overlaps, right? Mm. So I have some partnerships with uh, different groups, with chaplaincy, with you know you know mental health and and spiritual health. But alhamdulillah, that's. Excellent. That's oh, I don't know how you have the energy because for <laughs> listeners who don't know, I mean, you join <laughs> us uh, to do the recording after a program that you held right here at MCC. So yes. you have, uh, you know, boundless energy. So mashallah, mashallah, mashallah. and, <laughs> and so may Allah confident. continue that and give you health and afia uh, to mean, continue uh, the work uh, that you do. So thank you so much. And listeners, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions or thoughts or comments, you can reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com 
engage us on uh, social media, facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence, Twitter. Uh, feel free to reach out at any time and you can join us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Jazakallah. Thank <laughs> you.